Herkese günaydınlar. Good morning everyone. My name is Alper Acar and I'm the sector manager in the European Union delegation to Turkey. And I would like to welcome you all to this webinar on European Green Deal business action towards climate neutrality. Throughout the webinar, we have simultaneous interpretation. You can choose the language you would like to listen from the interpretation button. And secondly, this webinar will be recorded. Those who cannot attend at the moment will be able to watch the webinar uh, in YouTube or through other channels later on. European Green Deal was announced at the end of 2019 by the European Union and the European Green Deal uh, attracted attention not only in Turkey but all around the world. Uh, discussions on digital platforms, uh, NGOs, um, um, academicians, uh, business community ha have all been involved in these discussions on digital platforms. A European Green Deal um, does not only bring along a new angle to uh, our life, uh, but also international negotiations uh, continue at the moment, though there is some setback because of the pandemic, especially the meeting to be held in Glasgow, uh, we'll be discussing some technical aspects of the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, the ex expectation is uh, to make sure that countries come up with more ambitious goals in terms of the Paris Climate Agreement. This is what is expected of the summit. And the main reason is uh, to make sure uh, that uh, this 1.5 uh, degree Celsius limit is achieved as put forward by the Paris Climate Agreement. However, at the moment, if things go as the way they are, this limit uh, will be only 2.5 or 3.5 degrees Celsius. Therefore, countries need to um, set a more ambitious goals and take uh, better uh, precautions. With the European Green Deal, uh, the EU aims uh, to be climate neutral by 2050. But uh, this is not uh, going to impact Europe only, um, but it will have a global impact. And um, following this European Green Deal, other countries are also setting their climate neutral objectives, uh, though the dates differ. Uh, the European Green Deal covers many topics. So it's um, an integrating vision or a policy document. And uh, it, the basic goal is that uh, Europe will become a climate neutral continent by 2050, but it also will increase competitiveness, will make sure that there is more fair distribution. And uh, it also aims uh, to tackle issues such as pollution, public health. So it uh, has um, integrated objectives and it's based on three main principles. Um, one is do not harm, do no harm. This actually emphasizes that all other policies and policy areas need to contribute to this or it does not hinder any developments in other policy areas. Uh, it should become um, even more ambitious 
and it should make sure that all these objectives are achieved achieved another principle it's based on is leave no one behind Uh, the socioeconomic disparities between European countries or even within countries or communities that will be negatively impacted by the changes that would be brought along by European Green Deal will be protected. So uh, this principle foresees that additional resources will be allocated uh, to make sure that these countries or communities uh, are not left behind. With the COVID pandemic, many resources have been al allocated to public health measures. And COVID-19 actually showed us how fragile we are and how uh, there are gaps between nature and our social life or nature and economic life. So policies and structures need to be reorganized or re-structured. Uh, so make better is the third principle. So these three principles are the fundamentals of European Green Deal and its related policies. Since the announcement of the European Green Deal, a new strategy is being launched almost every month. Uh, these are strategies related to sea pollution, metals, industrial strategies, SME strategies. Uh, so in various uh, fields, uh, policies are being launched to achieve climate ne neutral uh, objective. So not as a policy actually only, uh, but the uh, climate uh, law uh, actually aims uh, to reduce greenhouse gases by 55 percent in 2030 and also aims to achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2050 so this has become a part of the eu legislation at the moment this might impact international trade production uh, and consumption patterns uh, it also uh, covers decarbonization as well and all this legislation will be launched by the european union in july of course these changes will not happen overnight this is a process uh, one uh, exciting issue is uh, the uh, integration of the hydrogen energy with the electricity system. So by uh, 2030, this energy will become commercial. This is the aim. And after 2030, uh, this will be integrated with uh, the generation of electricity to achieve decarbonization aims. This is just an example. So uh, in the coming days, we will see more exciting uh, and new developments. The uh, European Union will continue to launch uh, these uh, policies and actions. Now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to organizations which support us. And I now would like to give the floor to Orhan Turan, uh, the chairman of Turconfet, for his opening speech. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Dear friends, on behalf of the board of Turconfet, I would like to welcome each and every one of you. It's a great pleasure for us uh, to be a part of this webinar on European Green Deal organized by the European Union delegation. we will be discussing the business action towards uh, climate change in this webinar and this will contribute to the green transformation in our country i believe this will raise awareness um, in this respect so our blue planet has limited resources and today we do not only see 
economic transformation crisis, but also climate crisis today. Uh, sustainability of the linear economic system seems to be impossible at the moment because of the stress it puts on resources. Therefore, we need to meet today's needs in a balanced way. We need to foresee future needs. And for this, a new vision needs to be launched. This is very important. Uh, the uh, disasters, pandemic, uh, climate change can only be resolved uh, by a collaborative approach on a global level. To see out UNDP and to confit has established a platform of, uh, of business community for uh, targets and we are producing projects to contribute to this process this uh, platform has uh, 17 objectives it has a wide coverage which includes the business community ngos and private sector so we are uh, aiming uh, to make sure uh, that uh, business community uh, develop, takes action. Our world is changing from industry to services. We see a transformation in all industries, uh, smart factories, artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, uh, are some of the uh, developments uh, which bring along a new century for us. But in the meantime, we are faced with climate events such as floods, heat waves, etc. And they bring along uh, social uh, threats um, as well. For instance, the mucilage in Marmara Sea is caused by global warming due to climate change. And this actually is an example of irreversible damage to the environment. In 2020, uh, average temperature was uh, 1.4 degrees uh, higher uh, in our country. And in the last 150 years, uh, the uh, temperature rise in the world was 0.8 degrees and one degree in Europe. If we do not limit emissions in the coming 50 years, uh, the temperatures will rise as high as three degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, and these studies show us uh, that climate change is the biggest threat at the moment. Therefore, the business community needs uh, to come up uh, with a joint opinion about uh, the threats that climate change poses. And I believe we have this joint opinion. So we need to take action now. We do not just speak about this problem. It is now time to take action. Uh, the European Green Deal of the European Union is a new ecosystem approach, which is supported by the new Biden administration as well. It draws a new roadmap. Um, the objective is climate neutrality. And the European Green Deal is uh, aiming to change the game itself, not the rules of the game. So it changes all the balances with this new order. In reducing carbon emissions, uh, the timing announced by China and digitalization and green transformation all shape the roadmap for our world. For countries that are affected by climate change, a green transformation is not a luxury, but it is a must. Digital transformation is going to be a leverage for the business community. And similarly, green transformation will do that as well. And within the framework of the Paris Climate Agreement, new and creative solutions need to be put in place so that we can take action as soon as pos possible. A green transformation based on renewing our economy with new technologies needs to be planned. Sustainable growth and development taking into account climate change is very important. Therefore, 
industries, sectors, SMEs, and uh, the business community will also embrace new opportunities by this green transformation. Uh, uh, SMEs uh, uh, create 72% of employment and uh, of exports and 37% of employment. So SMEs need to be aware of uh, green policies and the cost advantage opportunities to have access to new markets and low carbon economy and growth in line with climate change in this process smes can act as a catalyst but of course we need to take into account the fragility and vulnerability of smes high efficiency and high value added uh, objectives of the SMEs need to be supported by green transformation policies and incentives. Our country has signed the Paris Agreement, Climate Agreement. We need to ratify it. So uh, this will also help us uh, benefit from uh, green transformation funds as well. Uh, in the modernization of the customs union, European Green Deal needs to be uh, taken into account from the SME perspectives. For Turkey not to be left out of the game, the awareness and leadership of the business community, uh, the awareness to be raised by uh, business community and its leadership are very important. Um, we believe that green transformation is going to be a leverage for sustainable growth and development in our country. As you know, in the last four years uh, we are involved in comprehensive collaborative efforts uh, we create value uh, with our digitalization projects we have digital anatolia project with which we have uh, reached out to 20,000 smes and 2,000 smes were provided with mentorship training and consultancy services on digitalization and in April, uh, we have uh, organized uh, the uh, 23rd Entrepreneurship Summit, and the focus in the summit was digitalization. And we have provided guidance uh, in this summit in terms of digitalization with more than 2,000 participants, and we shared our report with the public opinion. And in the coming months, in the business community in Anatolia, we will be organizing awareness raising activities about green transformation chambers, uh, NGOs and representatives of business communities in Anatolia will be provided with information about green transport uh, transformation and we will help them and support them uh, as uh, like in the digital transformation. Uh, uh, we, as Turkon FET, uh, will be raising awareness in the business community in Anatolia uh, with uh, our uh, large network. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ambassador um, Nicholas Meyer Landrut uh, for uh, including us in this effort, and I hope uh, that. Uh, cooperation between Tur Turkey and the e EU will result in a full membership. And I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Turan. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, the TUSIAT president, Mr. Simone Kozlowski. The floor is yours, sir. Mr. Minister, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished participants, I would like to welcome each and every one of you on my behalf and on behalf of TUSIAD board. Climate change is uh, uh, on top of our agenda, and it, therefore it's a great pleasure for me to be with you in a webinar on climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, World Economic Forum um, forums 2021 report says that uh, one of uh, the uh, five um, most dangerous uh, threats in the coming years is 
uh, contagious diseases and the rest four is about climate uh, change. So the measures that we will be taking uh, to reduce carbon emissions uh, will uh, help us reverse some of the negative consequences of climate change because the ecosystem can renew itself. However, the population is increasing rapidly and uh, this ability uh, becomes futile. And uh, these uh, uh, triggers like carbon emissions can be really uh, dangerous uh, for the global community. This we have seen in the COVID-19 pandemic. In terms of the dimensions of climate change, we need to take certain measures in our life and in our business life. It, it is now more critical to take these measures and to fight against climate change, we need to have a reinforced collaboration between national and international actors. Uh, the uh, existing measures will not be enough uh, to limit the temperature rise uh, by 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, sustainable development and the protection of environment are two issues uh, that uh, take place in our bylaws, bylaws of TUSIAT. So TUSIAT gives priority to environmental issues while doing business. And we believe that we are undertaking an important role in this respect on all platforms. Uh, TUSIAT uh, always reminds that we are located in uh, uh, a geography that is impacted by the climate change most. Therefore, we need to address uh, this problem. So in all our sectoral uh, activities, uh, we take into account different aspects of climate change. Um, Paris uh, Climate Agreement is the basis for our uh, climate action document. And we update this document, taking into account in current developments. Before COP26, uh, we need uh, to become a party to the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the industry needs to internalize sustainability and the use of renewable resources need, needs uh, to be given more importance. Mechanisms uh, for sustainability uh, ac ac that we have in place actually are an indication of our uh, action in this respect. And we need to be involved in this process actively on an international level. Uh, the European Green Deal has a roadmap that aims to have climate neutrality by 2050, and we need to devise roadmaps in line with this. Uh, this will help. Uh, the, this will also support the predictability of investment environment, and it will also be a strong framework for having access to funding and finance for environmental, social and economic sustainability. Holistic measures need to be put into place to become a part of green transformation. A green economy model has environmental values, but it also creates opportunities for employment and investments. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the challenges posed by the pandemic, climate issue is high on the agenda of countries. This is very important. Different industries are uh, making plans in line with uh, the climate change and uh, important actors in the finance world have climate policies. Developments in technology and digitalization help reducing greenhouse gases and acting in line with climate change developments. However, we have to accept and recognize that we are faced with a very challenging fight. So fighting the climate change requires an inclusive and a long-term effort. 
International Energy Agency has published the Net Zero Report. And this report is very important in terms of measures that need to be taken by the energy industry that is right at the heart of climate change issues. Uh, the, the report attracts attention to behavioral changes, and this is very important in terms of uh, transforming the uh, sector. Uh, individual preferences and uh, changes in lifestyles are as important as using renewable resources. Another important issue is uh, that by 2050, uh, technologies uh, will uh, help reduce uh, carbon emissions. Uh, these technologies are very new at the moment. Some are prototypes, but this is very important because this means uh, that R&D plays a very important role in fighting uh, the climate change. Uh, the business commu as business community, our priorities uh, are based on technology and capacity building, uh, taking into account climate change. Of course, it is the public sector that is the most significant actor. And another actor is international policymakers. Ladies and gentlemen, in the coming days, not only energy and industry, but all sectors will need to implement radical policy changes and transformation. Med uh, Mediterranean is going to be impacted by the climate change most and products and services that will be produced in our country might have some competitive uh, difficulties. Therefore, we need to take into account climate change very seriously. Its impact on vegetation or its impact on safe and secure food or the effective use of land. And similarly, water policies are very important. We are faced with multi-layered risks. These risks, um, concern multiple areas. Therefore, the new economy, economy system should be more sustainable, more environment friendly, fit more fair and equitable. And I, we believe that this is uh, going to be an opportunity if we uh, design the new economy as such. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change um, is also taking its place at the heart of social and economic policies. Country, uh, the European Union is designing its, the econo its economic model based on a carbon and climate neutral uh, environment. And we are closely following uh, the practices of the European Union in this respect. Uh, to see that, um, um, has the capacity to uh, accelerate uh, uh, activities uh, in Turkey. EU and Turkey is discussing the modernization of customs union, and I believe that uh, taking action towards this goal will also accelerate uh, the developments, uh, the developments in technology, digitalization, actually are changing the dynamics of uh, global uh, trade. So uh, green transformation and uh, al alignment with European Green Deal will be an important topic in discussions between the EU and Turkey, we believe. Therefore, in green and digital transformation, public-private partnership is very important. And in fighting against climate change, high-level dialogues need to be established. A digital single market perspective uh, needs all to be taken into account as well. So uh, regulatory framework for customs union negotiations uh, will 
have to take this into account as well. And that is why in line with sustainable development goals, uh, customs union uh, needs to be modernized with a comprehensive partnership approach so that uh, Turkey also assumes uh, EU's uh, green and digital uh, transformation. Public institutions, business organizations and NGOs need to act in collaboration. This is very important for the uh, foreseeability and predictability of the investment environment as well. And therefore, um, we have established a task force, which is also going to take place in EU um, activities. European Union is our um, partner and a European Green Deal is on the EU's agenda and all our working groups closely following uh, the developments there. And uh, the impact of the new climate regime uh, was discussed and on the 11th of June, um, we will also publish a report that discusses uh, the EU's action plan in this respect. The framework drawn by the European Green Deal needs to be seen as a leverage to turn climate change into an opportunity. Green transformation is possible only when it covers all um, stakeholders uh, within the framework of Fit for 55, uh, carbon regulations at the borders are uh, going to be critically important for EU and Turkey. Uh, so it is very important that uh, we know how this regulation will be implemented and not uh, to uh, hinder uh, any inter not to cause any interruption in uh, trade uh, so in involving turkey in these endeavors will also help alignment with the european green deal under business europe the european business community is also indicating the importance of um, green uh, and uh, uh, digital transformation in uh, customs union negotiations as well. I believe this issue is very important and hopefully it will create a positive environment uh, between the EU uh, and Turkey. We would like to thank uh, Mr. Kaslovsky for this very comprehensive uh, deliberation. And uh, of course, together with Orhan Turan's comments, we have uh, actually identified the importance. Uh, before I give uh, the floor to uh, Madame Vinton, I would like to open a new parenthesis here. Uh, what does the climate neutral mean? Uh, Actually, this means that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that we release uh, to uh, the atmosphere and uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we receive from the atmosphere reach a certain uh, balance. And uh, I do believe uh, that uh, this is uh, crucial uh, for uh, the forests, uh, for the seas, for the oceans, and for uh, good agricultural practices uh, so that we can actually uh, establish a balance uh, by receiving them back from the atmosphere. So closing the parenthesis here, and before taking too much of your time, I would like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Madame Louisa Vinton, the UNDP resident representative. Thanks so much, uh, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the United Nations Development Program, uh, I'd like to thank the European Union delegation for the kind invitation to speak and join in welcoming all our participants to today's event. Uh, as everyone knows, I'm very new here in the Turkey. This is uh, just coming to the close of my fourth week on the job. And uh, owing to pandemic conditions, I am meeting the other speakers on the panel for the first time. So just to say hello and to, to, to, be, to, to say how honored I am to be in the distinguished company of the 
uh, Mr. Minister of the Environment and Urbanization, the EU ambassador, and the heads of uh, the two major voices of the business community in Turkey. Um, I'm very keen in particular to hear uh, this very positive feedback. I think we are facing this conundrum of uh, with uh, the European Green Deal or more broadly with the idea of a transition to green growth and and, uh, and uh, what we call net zero future or a carbon neutral future, whether that actually means growth and new jobs or it's something more uh, more negative. And I'm very pleased to hear that we, we seem all to be on the same wavelength, that this is uh, indeed an opportunity uh, rather than a, a threat or we're trans transforming a threat into an opportunity together. Um, in, a, in a very complicated world that we're living in now uh, and in, still in the midst of the global pandemic, uh, UNDP and in fact the entire United Nations family has put climate change at the very top of the agenda of all the issues we're facing. And I think this is a, a shared, I think, hierarchy of, uh, of uh, the participants here today. So we're, we're keenly engaged in today's topic and are keen to provide all the support we can to uh, the government side, the business side, and indeed to the uh, the side that's been mentioned often about uh, leaving no one behind to ensure that uh, vulnerable groups do not suffer from, from this, uh, the challenges of climate change, but also the shift to, uh, to uh, a, greener, a greener model of growth in the future. Uh, many of the speakers have already uh, underlined the urgency of taking action. And indeed, uh, you know, we see uh, that we're sort of at, the, the stroke of midnight in, in terms of the possibility of reversing negative trends. And I was really stunned this week to read that um, the, the World Meteorological Organization, the weather forecasting arm of the United Nations, is now predicting that in the next five years, we will hit this 1.5 degree centigrade increase so that it, it's not something anymore science fiction or in the distant future for our for our children or grandchildren to worry about. It's really a very immediate uh, threat. Um, and I think, you know, where we are seeing the biggest impact of climate change is also a big motivator to action. Uh, you know, we are seeing extreme weather events uh, with greater frequency and greater violence than ever before. And there's been a mention of, of floods. We have droughts and forest fires. Um, and it's clear that these trends have huge human and economic costs. So over the past 20 years, uh, our UN disaster entity is, is reporting that the, the death toll from climate related disasters is over 500,000 people. And the deadliest natural disaster of 2019 worldwide was the heat wave in Europe, which cost uh, 2,500 lives. And it seems every day there's a new headline that underlines just really how close we are to some sort of what our secretary general calls the climate abyss. Uh, this morning's New York Times carried a story about how um, more than a third of heat related deaths uh, can be attributed to the additional warming from climate change. Um, and that this has led to a 5% increase in mortality in some locations. And as is the normal, the pattern everywhere, unfortunately, with climate change. Those who have done the least to cause the damage of climate are the ones who are experiencing the most severe impact. Um, I also saw a study today that uh, our colleagues from the Food and Agriculture Organization are, are reporting the, the increased threat of uh, plant pests from climate change. So they're saying that it just takes one unnaturally warm winter like the one I think we've just experienced in many parts of the world to, to lead to huge infestations that can destroy uh, entire crops. And our colleagues at the United Nations Refugee Agency are reporting now that weather related crises are causing twice as much displacement as conflicts and wars. So we really do have a big human toll and a big sense of urgency in addressing the, the challenge. We also have the Glasgow uh, meeting coming up, uh, and and I think this is being portrayed by by our our UN side as really one of the last chances for global agreement to undertake the more ambitious uh, commitments that even after Paris are required to have the hope of halting uh, the sort of the surging 
disasters we're seeing everywhere around the world. Um, our Secretary General is pushing for a commitment by all participants to a net zero uh, approach by, by the year 2050. Um, as our EU colleague was describing today, it's a very ambitious target, but there is some good news in that countries that account for 73% of all carbon emissions have already signed on to this uh, pledge. And really our appreciation goes out to the European Union for taking a leadership role in this and making this commitment in, on top of the European Green Deal um, provisions. Um, the, the challenge we face is that we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, we have fallout in the form of setbacks in terms of economic growth, huge job losses, and a big impact on all sorts of uh, the most vulnerable po populations around the world. I think there's a very strong desire uh, among the public, but also among uh, some political leaders and economic figures to get back to business as usual. And the position that we're taking at UNDP and across the wider UN is really that there is no way back to business as usual. And we need to grasp these challenges that we face with renewed determination. You know, We're using the slogan, build back better, um, but really to take on climate change. And as the other speakers have mentioned, not just to address the climate challenge, but to take on the whole issue of, of the threats to, the, to nature, to biodiversity that we've seen the pandemic being a symptom of uh, Human, humanity pushing the boundaries of the natural world too far. And as our secretary general has, uh, is saying now, instead of waging war on the planet, we need 2021 to be the year in which we declare peace with the planet. Um, so in this context, you know, I think we see big, big synergies, if not a complete identity with the European uh, Green Deal that you know, we've just published at UNDP uh, a human development report, annual human development report, that really simplifying rather dramatically says that, you know, in the history of humanity, a development has been achieved at the cost of environmental destruction. And there's a direct correlation between levels of human development and levels of environmental destruction. And the point of that report is to say, okay, we have to break this link and find a way to deliver growth with nature. And, you know, so it's so pleasing to see in the European Green Deal that this, the idea of we need to decouple economic growth from resource use. So I think we're very much on the same, on the same uh, wavelength uh, to cut emissions while creating jobs. And uh, so this brings us to the theme, I think, of today's discussion and where, you know, we really need to hear from the business community that you know, I think a lot of people have used green jobs and green growth as quite easy slogans to say, okay, we can move and there is a future, but we need to say how, and we need to say, you know, the, present the practical examples of, of, of how this can be done. These are all efforts that UNDP is very much involved in, uh, in supporting directly with, the, with practical examples. So we're very proud not only to be a partner supporting the government in preparing the big plans for 2030 and 2050 on climate mitigation and adaptation, and also working at the local level with the great gratitude to our EU partners for financial support there, but also doing things like training uh, people in communities that are hosting large numbers of refugees in renewable energy skills as a way of driving people who, who need employment into uh, renewable technologies as, a, as a, uh, a source of livelihood, in bringing affordable solar power to some of Turkey's poorest uh, villages. Um, you know, we are very wasteful about everything in today's economy, including wasting our waste. And uh, I was pleased in yesterday's discussion on infrastructure as part of the Syrian refugee response to hear that so many of the uh, infrastructure facilities for waste management that are being constructed by UNDP and other parties in this crisis aim to provide a source of income to municipalities, not, not just by providing a, an environmentally sound way of disposing of waste, but, but using waste as an income stream. And I think this is all part of the green, the green growth paradigm. But we're also working on developing energy efficient engines for manufacturing on sustainable tourism and on developing the idea that local communities should be sort of employed as guardians of nature rather than 
uh, as predators of nature, you're sort of cutting down forest for heating and things like that. And also we're working on, um, through our accelerator lab on uh, behavioral issues, because I think individual behavior is an important part of any equation of looking at how to convince uh, people not to, to assume their coffee cup will be recycled, but to bring their ceramic mug to their place, uh, their favorite coffee coffee shop. So there's lots of work, on, very practical work in addition to the theoretical planning work going on at UNDP. And uh, we're, very, we're hopeful that these will be of use to the business community and to, as well as to the policy community. Uh, really a lot of the weight for this trans transformation will be on the shoulders of the private sector, but also it depends very much on government to provide incentives and investments. And here we would really just point very much to a shift from incentivizing fossil fuels to some kind of carbon tax or putting a price on carbon emissions. And we see looking at the world today that far more, I think it's $182 billion in 2020 were spent on fossil fuel subsidies. And think of the impact that could be had by transferring those to uh, renewables or to other forms of green growth. Um, and as we make this transition, we're very much aware of the need to uh, ensure a just transition to leave no one behind. So if we're going to move away from coal to ensure that those who depend on the coal sector for their livelihoods have a, have a way out. But we do see in all this a huge opportunity for Turkey in particular, and the mention has been made of the customs union, but uh, we're very keen to support this idea that Turkey can manufacture through its uh, very vibrant and uh, re resourceful manufacturing sector uh, feed into the European Green Deal by being a source of these uh, green products, green services uh, for export, that this is a huge opportunity, not just for the European Union, but for, for Turkey in particular. Uh, so we look forward to working uh, in many ways, including through the Business for uh, Goals uh, platform that was mentioned early on to provide whatever support we can. And we're very keen today to listen and learn and to hear about uh, examples of other support that can help to facilitate this very important transition. So thanks so much. And thanks again to the European Union for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Winton, uh, and uh, welcome to Turkey again. Uh, now, uh, I would like to give the floor to uh, uh, our uh, ambassador and uh, head of the EU delegation to Turkey, Mr. Nicolas Mayer Landert. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, distinguished Minister of Environment and Urbanization, distinguished President of TUSIAD, distinguished Chairman of the Board of Turkonfet, uh, distinguished UNDP resident uh, representative UNDP here in Turkey, dear participants and dear participants also of the press. I'm happy to be with you all on this webinar on European Green Deal. Business action towards climate neutrality is the subject, and I think it's a very pertinent subject. I'm addressing you from the Konya Chamber of Industry. The Konya Chamber of Industry is hosting our EU Information Center here in Konya, and I thank them very much for their support and for making it possible that I can join this webinar from here. Today, we talk about uh, climate change and how important it is to tackle this challenge. Uh, I will speak a little bit about this from our perspective. Uh, I will not dwell much on technology's impact of climate change. We are all witnessing the consequences. You have been uh, exposing it uh, previously, but I perhaps refer quickly to the mayor of Kanya with whom I just had a little discussion here before joining this webinar. And he said how, how much, for example, it, it, it, Konya as a region is suffering already today from climate change. So it's real, it's happening everywhere. And it is something which we need to tackle. Uh, humanity to a certain extent, if you want, has spent its credit too fast. Uh, just in the last 200 years after the industrial revolution, human-induced greenhouse gas from fossil fuel exposed us with an extensional threat of global warming leading to climate change. 
And there's no doubt that this is a real threat to all of us. Scientists have been warning us for years. As citizens, we are witnessing the negative consequences of climate change, but as societies, we have been too slow. We all know that we have already passed the stage of asking why and what, and that we actually know what we need to do. There is a solution. The solution is decarbonization of our economies, of our lives. In 1990, in the Rio summit, the world recognized that climate change jeopardized human developments. But it took another 25 years to the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015 that the international community put forward a rescue plan. The target of the Paris Agreement is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, yeah. as scientists have suggested to us. But we know today that despite the current climate targets put forward by countries under the Paris Agreement, it is estimated that we will reach a global average annual temperature rise, which is much higher between 2.5 and 3.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, unless additional action is taken. The window of opportunity is narrowing now, and we need to take action now if we want to see its impact in the coming decades. Until now, 191 countries out of 997 countries have already ratified the Paris Agreement, including the EU, China, Russia, India, and recently, as a good news, the US has rejoined the agreement. This means that the Paris Agreement is for all of these countries part of their legislation. The EU, for the EU, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is the fundamental step in the global effort to fight collectively against climate change. And I truly hope that Turkey will soon be able to see its remaining concerns addressed and thus able to also ratify this agreement. We as European Union have a comprehensive and ambitious legislative framework on climate action in line with our Paris Climate Agreement targets. With the Green Deal, the EU puts a bold target to become climate neutral by 2050 and to address all the pressing challenges on that way. This is important to understand that to build a climate neutral, modern, resource efficient, clean, circular, competitive economy, that this is something which we need to see not only in Europe, but across the world. Climate neutrality of the Green Deal is thus reflected in our case in all key policies, starting from energy to agriculture, from nature conservation to transport, and so on. Every sector has to contribute. And also, we started to reform the financial system. We need to go much faster and much more in the direction of green financing. By setting into motion the European Green Deal, the train, if you want, for change has already left the station. But yet, now it needs to pick up speed, and everybody has to contribute. Strong engines need to pull the train. One of these engines is the private sector. Another important engine will be research and innovation. The industry accounts for roughly 30% of global carbon dioxide emissions. New circular business models, recycling, energy, material efficiency, new consumption patterns have a significant potential to cut global greenhouse gas emissions. Therefore, private sector in the EU and Turkey play an important role in the transition to a sustainable future. The EU is the world's largest trading bloc, and we want to do this together with our partners as the global challenge stemming from climate change cannot be addressed by individual countries or union of countries. Given the global character of climate change and sustainability challenges, it is clear that green adjustment needs to be spread all along global supply chains. Supporting green transition, promoting responsible, sustainable value change is one of the six priorities 
of the EU's new trade policy adopted earlier this year. Both the European Green Deal and the new strategy for EU trade policy refers to the respect of the Paris Agreement as an essential element of future trade agreements. Turkey is an important economic partner. Turkey is the sixth largest trading partner of the EU. The EU is Turkey's largest trade, trade partner and major source of foreign direct investment. Turkey is an important part of our European value chains. Therefore, our convergence in climate policy is a requirement, but it's also natural, unavoidable process as business converge their plans and practices. We rely on good and motivated work of our Turkish partners in the public and in the private sector. So I'm happy to have Tusia to confer, but of course also the minister present in this webinar. A couple of days ago, we launched our climate diplomacy campaign in Turkey 2021 in the Center for Solar Energy Research and Applications, Sweenam. Sweenam demonstrates us what to do by conducting research for making solar energy feasible, accessible, more competitive. Centers like Guinan indicate the synergy of cooperation between research and industry and tell us that deploying renewable energy is already feasible and doable for companies. I'm quite sure that this is also the case for energy efficiency, circular economy applications, and many more other items. In this direction, we have to start to see the costs of climate neutrality as an investment for a sustainable future. Those who invest today in green technology will be the market leaders of tomorrow. And I'm sure that during this webinar, you will find many other stories like Vinam who can inspire others. Bearing in mind that climate change impacts all, whether you're a journalist, politician, business person, farmer, student, teacher, no one is immune. We think we need to encourage and invite all of you and citizens of Turkey to join our climate diplomacy campaign and spread the words through the public activities, through our social media campaign, and in all our private conversations. Let me thank our Turkish partners and their staff for their very important and valuable cooperation. First and foremost, of course, the Minister and the Ministry of Environment and Organization, Tusiad and its president, Turkonfet, the chairman of its board, Mr. Vin Mrs. Vinton, UNDP representative, who is a very valuable partner for our activities here in Turkey. So I wish you all a very successful meeting and let us work together to save the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Landrut. And now I would like to leave the floor uh, to Minister of Environment on Urbanization, uh, Mr. Murat Kurum. The floor is yours, sir. Distinguished Ambassador, uh, distinguished uh, President of uh, Tusiat, and distinguished representatives of the business uh, circles, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to greet each and every one of you. Of course, climate change and the effects of climate change uh, become when we look at it, uh, has come to affect the whole world. And uh, of course, we are all seeing in that we need to take uh, the measures and the world is uh, giving us signal to do so. In today's meeting, we will be talking about the European Green Deal uh, that was declared by the EU at the end of 2019 and uh, also uh, the carbon regulation at the border. We will be uh, discussing the these uh, instruments. I do hope that this meeting and webinar will be beneficial for uh, our nation, for our country, and for, for the business circles. The distinguished participants uh, established their comments uh, in a very important manner with the, the EU uh, delegation to Turkey, as uh, well as with the, the uh, civil society organizations, uh, with the local uh, authorities, we uh, are determined uh, to take uh, all relevant steps. 
today we uh, are actually uh, taking into consideration uh, the uh, sun in terms of the sympathy and uh, the uh, soil in terms of its coverage. And we are here in the presence of uh, Rumi, which has dictated this philosophy to us. This is a city uh, which we're just uh, here in a uh, Meram uh, area and just next to uh, these uh, spiritual areas. So we're hosting the ambassador here. And uh, I do believe that uh, this is a very important state to be in in uh, today's world. But unfortunately, we are also in Konya, which is uh, sensing in the effects of uh, this climate change uh, in a very deep manner. Uh, in the past, we would have uh, been able to uh, find water just one and a half uh, meters below the ground. But uh, today, it's uh, even difficult to find water if you go dig if you go and dig two kilometers. This is a very old and historical site. And it is actually a, a very distinct area. And unfortunately, one of the lakes in this area is almost dried up. Of course, we have now been working to revive this lake because of floods and droughts all over our country. We are experiencing one disaster after another. And in such disasters, we are unfortunately losing lives. Today, in, in the uh, polls, we are uh, seeing that the uh, icebergs there are, uh, the uh, ice is being melting. And we are facing uh, with the, the for, uh, deforestation and many areas are uh, experiencing uh, such a uh, disasters. Pandemics have become the biggest threat for humanity, but despite all these uh, negative uh, effects, the interest uh, to climate change is increasing day by day in a simultaneous matter. Uh, we, uh, with a historical perspective, the uh, framework document that was uh, signed in Rio in 1992, until uh, since then, we have started seeing that this is like a constitution of climate change. And uh, this was followed by the Kyoto Protocol and uh, the 21st COP and the Paris Agreement. So this has uh, more or less shifted it from the principles and wishes and commitments to the law of uh, the uh, matter. Uh, but we can also say that uh, we can see some successful examples as well as some unsuccessful examples. So it's not just uh, something that we are talking about in terms of the environment, but this is a problem of economy and a problem of uh, development and we can say uh, that climate change has now become a phenomena which affects our understanding for architecture and also uh, our uh, daily life in our provinces the united nations uh, the eu and uh, structures like the oic are uh, presenting new bills or new uh, bids for the whole world and they're taking new decisions that is going to affect the geography of the whole world so with the european green deal uh, this is actually a new proposal that has been presented uh, to the world it's now uh, taken its position in the agenda uh, as you will remember a similar example was uh, put into effect in uh, the US in 2018. And US had declared that under the new green order, uh, they would be uh, effectively taking measures uh, to decarbonization. But when you look at uh, this whole matter, everybody was questioning the validity of uh, the project and the reactions increased because it was an unsuccessful example because it could not be something that is done by one uh, single power. And uh, during this period, uh, the EU has uh, actually 
it decreased its uh, emissions by 23% and increased its economy by 62%. So this is a good example that uh, the climate targets of the EU could be attained. Our aim is actually uh, to uh, understand that the climate change has become the common problem of everybody. This thought is actually creating a new transformation in uh, the whole world. So European Union is actually uh, wishing to become the first continent that establishes and fulfills this transformation and become a pioneer in this area, this critical move of the European Union. And also the uh, idea that the term of using and throwing it away has ended is clearly seen. And this is actually, and this has been a model which has been handicapped. It has been a model this didn't, that didn't respect nature at all. There were limitless needs, whereas the resources were limited and it increased the competitiveness. When you look at the last 50 years, we have seen that the world's population has increased by twofold, but unfortunately the resource usage has actually increased by threefold. And we have started seeing in that uh, we need now need a model, a circular model of economy of getting, using, and recycling. In 2019, the EU established its commitments for the Green Deal and has indicated that Europe is going to be a continent which is carbon neutral in 2050, and that this is an important condition for the Paris Agreement. Of course, the agreement has also affected the European industry and there are certain uh, doubts that this is going to lead to slow economic growth, but they are working that with countries uh, that they are going to purchase goods from those countries need to be also carbon neutral and uh, the countries which sell goods for them uh, they are going to impose a carbon tax what does this mean let's clearly state in your country if you have a tax for the emissions then if you do not impose this tax within your country, then I will impose this. So when you are selling your products, this means that they, they will be collecting taxes from you. So uh, of course, uh, the is, are going to be issues that are going to be deliberated upon uh, during this webinar. And as uh, the ministry, we are a member of uh, the working group established under the coordination of the Ministry of Trade. And we're following these developments closely for the benefits of uh, and interests of our country. When we look at this all together, we can say that uh, the rate has uh, more or less been 50%. It's not just to protect our export, but also to increase this. All our institutions are working uh, wholeheartedly. On the uh, 6th of April, uh, we actually uh, had a meeting with uh, 11 ministers uh, to talk about the new economic opportunities that this uh, strategy is going to pose for us. And I should be mentioning that within our country for the last three decades, in terms of uh, fighting against climate change and adaptation, we are strengthening our legislation. And there is a very strong state bill. You will re uh, remember that in uh, the Human Rights Action Plan declared by uh, the uh, president, there has been a special section devoted to climate change. And uh, this is uh, established as a hum human right. And this underlines that although we do not have a historical uh, responsibility, this uh, development is crucial. And we uh, do believe that as Turkey, we are fulfilling all our responsibilities pertaining to climate change. And each and every day in relation to uh, fighting against climate change, we are trying to take all measures that are needed to be taken. When you look at this all together in all the parameters that change the climate, we can actually uh, say that we are a country that can uh, create projects and and sell these projects and uh, we are determined to fulfill our target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 20% in 2030. And uh, we have a lot of action plans uh, in, in the sector. And now it's uh, time for uh, implementing uh, these uh, in the local uh, action groups. Uh, we also have uh, 
under the auspices of the, of the first lady declared to the final communicate on climate change and we are preparing two legislation for the turkish national climate change strategy and climate change action plan which are going to be renewed in terms of the ets we are undertaking the establishment of legislation activities for energy facilities, for industrial facilities uh, to uh, produce uh, with a climate uh, change friendly production method. We are establishing also a platform for the national strategy. With all these activities, we have uh, totally focused on the European uh, Green Deal. Turkey, uh, and in terms of the environmental legislation is one of the most successful countries in terms of adaptation to the EU legislation. And whatever legislation that is present in the EU, we have actually enacted this. We have 60 regulations that have been aligned with the EU ACQUI, and we are, have come to a position of closing in the 27th chapter on environment. We are increasing our resource productivity, preserving our resources. We are actually supporting the transformation and recycling activities in our country, the green areas, forests, and uh, lakes and rivers are areas that have been declared to be protected. And in energy, we are also uh, establishing the green tr transformation and strengthening our climate legislation. So as the state, we are uh, to a great extent ready for the new EU policies. And our foresight for the future is not uh, just establishing a, a green zone or, or area, uh, but this is not going to be restricted to the European Union geography. It is going to be more uh, a global approach to avoid pollution, to decarbonize energy production and establishing a clean, healthy and green uh, transportation. They have actually issued a new uh, climate uh, legislation and they have established their action plan. And when we look at this, the public uh, institutions, the researchers and uh, the companies are not to just uh, the uh, parties. We're not just sufficing ourselves with discussing the outcome of this, but by uh, establishing a contact and determining the policies, we have uh, focused heavily on, on this uh, particular activity. The Green Deal with all its dimensions, uh, I do believe uh, have been uh, detailly analyzed what we need to do at this point, especially in relation to this just transformation and the, the industrial policies and the investment financing. We are uh, in conducting an in-depth analysis. We're following the developments uh, in the private sector, uh, but they also need to transform themselves uh, in the shortest term possible. All our ministries are fulfilling their obligations and they are uh, contacting the private sector. And uh, we do believe uh, that we will be supporting the private sector with these wishes and uh, opinions. I would like to greet each and every one of you. We would like to thank the Minister of Environment and Urbanization, Mr. Murat Kurum, uh, with the, their uh, speech. We have now completed the opening uh, session. I would once again uh, thank the Chairman of the Board of True Confed, Orhan Turan, uh, Mr. Simone Kaslowski, to the Stiad President, and also the NDP represented Representative Louisa Vinton, as well as Ambassador uh, Nicholas Mayran, uh, the head of the delegation to Turkey. We have now come uh, to the end of the first opening session. I now would like to invite you to join the next session.
Ee, herkese tekrardan merhabalar. Ee, Hello again, everyone. We will look at the EU Green Deal, and the session is more on the reactions from the business world to the Green Deal. Of course, as of end of 2019, there have been some heavy discussions, intense discussions, which we've also witnessed in the keynote speeches that uh, TUSIA, Turkonfet, UNDP, and the EU side are calling for more ambitious climate goals. And they consider it as a positive impact to Turkey's competitiveness. Now, within that frame, both for business for goals and TUSIAD and TÜRKONFED and the United Nations Development Programs approaches will be the subject matter of this session. I would like to, first of all, give the floor to Shikri Nuturk, the president of the Business for Goals Pro platform. The floor is yours, sir. Greetings. His Excellency, Mr. Minister, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished presidents of TUSIA, Turkonfet, distinguished participants, esteemed resident representative of the UNDP, and all the viewers, I'd like to greet you on behalf of the B4G platform. And also, I would like to wish Madam Winton welcome. We're quite excited to be working together. As Alper mentioned, since this morning, we've heard speeches uh, from Madam Winton, the Minister, His Excellency the Ambassador, and the presidents of the associations. They've been quite comprehensive and in-depth, and they've established the important points and the framework, why this is what it is. And the history, the background was quite thoroughly explained. And on the basis of that, rather than go into those issues again, I would like to talk about what the B4G platform is, what it does, why it was founded, what are its activities. And this climate change problem or crisis, and what we also aim to do as a platform in relation to the EU Green Deal, that is more what I'd like to talk about. The B4G platform aims to establish a bridge between the business world and the sustainable development goals, and also to strengthen the role of the business world in those goals. With, in collaboration with TUSIA, Turkonfed and UNDP, it was established by these three agencies in 2019, and the platform is there to assist businesses adopt climate ideas into their policies. As you know, the Sustainable Development Goals accepted in 2015, well, during the launch, something was particularly stressed, and that was the role of the private sector here is beyond a stakeholder, but it is a driving force, and there's a role of responsibility. And the speakers have already stated that in their keynotes. The private sector, be it under the umbrella of the SDGs or climate change and cohesion with the Green Deal, there's a great and very important role for the business world there. And our platform is a place where we can all come together around the 17 sustainable development goals. And we share this through a multi-stakeholder model. The founders are Tusiyar and Turkonfed, comprised of over 40,000 companies from large enterprises to SMEs, many private sector companies are represented by our founders. And of course, the UNDP has a vast global network and an accumulation of know-how, which we all bring together. Our efforts are focused on three pillars, one of which is resilience to climate change and disasters. 
and that is the main focus of my speech today to ensure business that businesses are prepared to possible crises and to contribute to the fight against climate change at a national and enterprise level the second pillar is to prepare enterprises for the future that is meeting their needs today and contributing to them being prepared for the conditions of the future and making it sustainable. The third pillar or the third focus is inclusive growth without leaving anyone behind. So comprehensive business models that will also help vulnerable groups advance in the business community. Those are the three main pillars of our work. For over a year, the Green Deal and the EU's new industrial strategy and circular economy. Well, we've worked extensively around these topics and very briefly, the circular economy, what we've done with the circular economy and what we plan to do about this model in the future, I would now like to share our actions and plans with you. His Excellency the Minister put it very well, the direct economy that is use and throw away is now a model of the past. Instead of that, every waste in the production chain being reused, thus lowering the cost and use of raw materials where the resource efficiency is maximized. That is what the circular economy is. And this has quite a significant place in the Green Deal. We've included the Circular Economy Action Plan in our working program to assist enterprises being helped uh, in their transition to a circular economy or a green economy. We've had various work in this direction and mainly on raising the awareness. And we've published the first Guide to Circular Economy for Enterprises in Turkey that is reducing the effects on the climate and preparing enterprises for the future. That is the aim of our work. Again, we have the Circular Economy Cooperative, Business World and Sustainable Development Association and World Gazette uh, together with them for the first time, we've organized the Circular Economy Week of Turkey in March, within the scope of which we've looked at existing practices and what steps need to be taken as well, were discussed. The EU's new economic strategy centered around fighting climate change makes the green transformation unavoidable for countries such as Turkey, which have political or economic ties with the EU. And I'd like to share with you some of the economic pillars thereof, also our plans for those pillars. The Green Deal brings about the carbon border adjustment and circular economy practices. Adaptation there too is crucial for uh, the Turkish industry to continue its presence in the EU market and to boost its competitiveness. And his Excellency, the Minister of Environment, also emphasized that this is very important for our competent competitiveness. If we can ensure this cohesion, we can even create an advantage. And I don't want to even think of a scenario where we cannot, because this agreement is at least as important as a customs union agreement. As regards the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the regulation is expected to be promulgated this month or next month, the latest, but with this mechanism, all import products to be presented to the EU market will be taxed depending on the their carbon intensiveness, energy, cement, steel, aluminum, oil refinery, paper, glass, chemicals, and fertilizers, such energy and carbon intensive sectors and for 52 products within scope and the value chains which they're a part of are expected to be subject to the carbon border adjustment. 
the issue of the calculation of the carbon composition of products we're going to export has yet to be clarified, but our ministries and especially the Ministry of Urbanization and Environment are considering establishing such a mechanism. This is the CBA pillar also on the uh, circular economy, the EU issued many regulations within the scope of the Green Deal for circular economy. The energy or the resource efficiency, durability and aftermarket responsibilities are some of the high standards that will be issued. Some of them have already been brought about. Minimizing raw material and resource usage, making clean technologies more effective and keeping life cycle of products to a maximum. And they prepared an action plan in 2020 to make circular economy to be the dominant way of doing business. Therefore, plastic packaging, textile and fashion, agriculture and food, batteries, electric and electronic devices, and construction materials sectors are priority sectors in the transformation. What they say is this is the most important issue. Now, after having talked about the platform and its outlook very briefly, I would now like to talk about what we would like to do as B4G. Now, in all institutions in various ministries, I believe it's nine ministries, there are action plans prepared. And TUSIA, TURCONFET, TIM, and many other CSOs, and the Global Compact as well, all around there is some effort, there are working groups being established, there are efforts to raise awareness. But all of that coming together to create synergy is what would be right. And the business world coming together with the public to make the necessary advocacy would be the better way. And beyond all of this, what is needed for the transformation of the industry, especially the 52 products and input sectors, uh, seven or eight uh, sectors for recycling and circular economy, we are in preparation that will assist particularly those 52 products. So the green transformation of the Turkish economy is the name of the program that we are currently trying to form, of course, with its inclusive approach, it can create multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder dialogue. Well, this is the structure that we already have as the B4G platform. So Turkey's adaptation to the Green Deal and adaptation of the industry to the Green Deal requires the coming together of all actors. And we want to bring them all together and work together with all those actors, Turkonfet, TUSIAD, UNDP, other UN agencies, the EU, the World Bank, other international organizations and accredited agencies included. All ecosystem actors concerned. Well, we think we will bring together the prioritized sectors in this program. And what we actually want to do very briefly is what we consider to be very important is the relevant international process and monitoring of the legal regulations and to carry out advocacy activities in Turkey. The Turkish business world will have a common vision and common mind on this. And in public debates, we'll have a public opinion, which will also, I believe, uh, assist the public sector greatly. The carbon border adjustment mechanism, the new industry strategy, the circular economy action plan, the European climate law, fit for 55 package, smart and sustainable mobility strategies. And uh, the minister mentioned the preparations for many of these. Uh, 
the digital decade preparations, human rights in global supply chains, and our draft bill on environment, and the renewed sustainable finance system are being, well, we would like to follow them very closely with other counterparts in the business world and participation to the relevant international processes or uh, to the regulations being made in our country, preparing national and regional strategies, being structured in favor of the Turkish industry. That is what we aim to advocate in the platforms where we partake. Another main pillar of this program, as I said, is the Think Do Tank. So it's a, because the B4G is a Think and Do Tank, our enterprises, our industries, transformation, to uh, the transition to a circular economy or when it comes to increasing their level of digitization or their adaptation to clean technologies are all the things that we aim to accelerate. To that end, all process services being structured and digital transformation being accelerated. While there is a need for human resources in this with, well, guys who are experts in all these areas unfortunately we do not have a sufficient number of such uh, guides or consultants through global compact turkey when it comes to reducing carbon emissions we uh, we're actually considering developing a cooperation with the global compact academy in turkey and the climate coal acceleration program implementation model will help us raise our uh, national experts for the sectoral strategy action plans and guidelines to be prepared. So it's not just a general circular economy, but a, a, a more breakdown, for example, plastics, electricity, textile sectors. We want to offer action plans that will uh, offer guidance to enterprises. And it, Raising awareness at different stages of the supply chain are also our other aims. And with the experts to be groomed, as I mentioned, we will have a sectoral and topical breakdown of the measuring and evaluation and roadmap developments that companies are going to need. We will be offering one-on-one uh, -on -one consultancy services in all these topics. So. All business organizations who want to work on these issues, all CSOs, well, our platform is very open and welcoming to you. I'd like to state that once again. Thank you very much to all those who contributed and I salute you all on behalf of B4G. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Shikri for his wonderful speech. The Sustainable Development Goals are the follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals. And while we're on that topic, and the goals are also, well, they, they have been accepted in the same year as the Paris Agreement from 2015. And one of the fundamental advocates of the SDGs is the UNDP, and I'd like to give the floor to them. Now we have from the Istanbul Regional Center a team leader, Laura Altinger, is with us. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much to the EU delegation for this invitation. We're very happy to be here and uh, to, to talk to you and to hear about uh, all the sustainability initiatives in Turkey. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen now. Uh, and uh, bring up my presentation. Yeah. 
So basically, uh, my presentation will cover risks and opportunities, uh, business climate action, and I'll be talking about uh, international uh, best practice uh, around the world. Uh, and then also I'll introduce to you some of the work that we do with business and uh, also with uh, development partners that, uh, that helps uh, businesses to become uh, more sustainable. Hmm. So I think that companies generally uh, recognize climate change as a risk. Uh, and uh, basically these, there are different types of risks, three types of risks. First of all, are the physical risks which arise from the extreme weather events, climate related weather events. And they, these damage property, they disrupt trade and supply chains of business. Uh, but there's also uh, the liability risks, which are very much increasing. And we see now that uh, activists or shareholder activists are, are uh, working uh, toward to put uh, pressure on companies. And we see uh, a number of uh, also uh, legal uh, cases being brought to the courts uh, to, to basically force uh, companies to uh, to become more sustainable in, in different ways. And then there's the uh, transition risks, and these stem from the changes in policy, uh, different new technologies that are emerging, and uh, these all cause a very large scale revaluation of assets. And so this is considered perhaps the largest risk of the transition uh, to a low carbon climate resilient future. And these risks uh, pose, uh, they're driving big changes in the uh, financial markets. But at the same time, companies also see uh, climate change as very much an opportunity. And I've blended in uh, some of the estimates that the IFC has provided, uh, where they uh, believe that the climate investment opportunities for the private sector to 2030 are amount to 23 million billion trillion dollars globally, and in only our region, the Europe and Central Asian region, it amounts to 665 billion. And we've blended in the sectors in particular where these opportunities are. And uh, this is mainly the building sector and the renewables, uh, followed by transport, energy efficiency, and then the wind and solar specifically. So what are some of the actions that businesses can take uh, to make themselves more sustainable? Well, I've, I've put in some ideas here. It's to identify the physical risks that climate change pose to their very own businesses. And this includes uh, uh, stress testing for climate, projected climate scenarios in the future. Also regularly planning for and disclosing and reporting and managing those risks. And I'll talk more about this in the coming slides. Other things that companies do is to incorporate shadow prices for carbon if you don't have an emissions trading system. And these are used uh, to incorporate into business plans. And, and of course, uh, many, uh, many projections for the carbon price show that the prices are very much on the rise. And we see already the ETS uh, price uh, in the EU is over 50 uh, euros, but the projections are even higher, uh, going up to $100 and, and upward. Uh, also, companies can set and meet their own emissions targets. And I'll talk a little bit about the net zero strategies. Uh, through emissions reductions that they undertake uh, themselves, and also uh, through offsetting uh, that, of course, uh, companies also resort to voluntary carbon markets in this case. Uh, and then companies are also increasingly investing in low carbon and renewable energy technologies uh, and improving their water and energy efficiency. And this is also helping them to achieve uh, cost reductions and greening supply chains. So uh, I want to introduce to you the uh, business, the global business coalition, uh, We Mean Business. And this is a coalition of over 1,800 companies 
that represent a $23 trillion of market capitalization. Uh, and these companies are uh, setting uh, ambitious targets. These are being accelerated through partnerships and enabling policy. And here I've blended in a few examples. It includes the RE100, which is the world's largest companies committing themselves to 100% renewable power. The, these are all business coalitions that target different things. The EV100 targets uh, making electric transport the new normal by 2030. Then there's the uh, EP100, which is a growing group of energy smart companies committed to improving their energy efficiency. But there's also uh, initiatives under this larger umbrella uh, coalition uh, that target climate smart, smart agriculture, that target steel zero, which is the 100% uh, net zero steel. And they use uh, enablers such as the carbon pricing, a responsible climate policy, and also this reporting and disclosure of climate information and climate-related risks that they face. So this is a, a very specific uh, initiative also, uh, which is under this umbrella, and it's the science-based uh, targets and net zero strategies. And these science-based targets provide companies with a clearly defined path uh, to reduce the emissions in line with the Paris Agreement goals, the, the overall climate objectives. And uh, of course, this is uh, science-based in the sense that uh, all the information from the scientific analyses are used in order to uh, ensure that it's aligned with the science behind the Paris Agreement. The science-based uh, uh, targets, they do make a, a lot of business sense. Uh, there have been a number of surveys uh, of businesses applying these targets, and they, they uh, show that, uh, that companies feel that uh, these targets help them to future-proof growth, help them to save money, to provide resilience against regulation. So uh, regulation, more and more regulation is expected in this area. So this allows companies already to prepare for uh, this type of regulation. And also it boosts investor confidence. It spurs innovation into the low carbon space and competitiveness. And it demonstrates concrete sustainability commitments to uh, consumers that have become increasingly uh, environmentally conscious. Now there's a, a task force on climate related disclosures, which was established in December, 2015. Uh, by the uh, FSB, the Financial Stability Board. And uh, this is, uh, has been created to develop voluntary climate-related financial risk disclosures by companies to inform investors and the public about their climate-related risks. And it results in markets becoming uh, better equipped to evaluate price and manage the risks. So we've already seen some shifts uh, in the markets, like around the stranded assets, uh, where uh, companies that are, uh, for example, relying heavily on the fossil fuels or on coal are already uh, these uh, stranded assets that in future will no longer be worth what they're worth today are, are uh, being priced in by the market into their uh, share prices and so on. And so this has really uh, started shifting uh, the whole uh, financial sector and the investors uh, as well, uh, their investors' view and their decisions. And uh, now, based on this success of the task force on financial, um, on, on climate-related financial disclosures, uh, there's a new uh, task force which has been created on nature-related financial disclosures. And this has been uh, launched, and in, uh, in the second half of 2023, they will be uh, ready to uh, have uh, the framework disseminated, their new framework disseminated, uh, similarly to, the, to this uh, TCFD uh, task force. And there will be certain uh, voluntary standards that companies can, can, uh, uh, can um, take into account uh, to, to uh, disclose and calculate and disclose their, their climate-related risks or nature-related financial risks. There's also uh, the Aarhus Convention, which is uh, a convention under the, our uh, sister organization, the UNECE, 
uh, which is uh, the uh, regional arm of the UN in the European region. And this is the first uh, legally binding uh, international instrument on pollutant release and transfer registers. And what it does is it makes the large uh, polluting industries uh, basically um, uh, report, measure and report on their emissions to air, water and land. And it, it encompasses 91, um, 91 hazardous substances, but uh, it also includes all the uh, greenhouse gases. And so this is a, a very a powerful instrument. And although it regulates the information on pollution rather than the pollution directly, uh, it's, it does exert a, a significant downward pressure on uh, these pollution levels of companies because companies don't want to be identified as amongst the biggest polluters. So it's a sort of an information-based instrument, similar to these other uh, disclosures, which allows uh, people then uh, and the public and so on and investors to take uh, action as needed. This is also a, a treaty, it's a global treaty, so anybody uh, can join. Uh, this, this treaty. I'll come now to uh, what UNDP does uh, in this space. And of course, uh, I believe that we're a very valued partner for the private sector. Uh, we advise companies on the carbon markets and uh, specifically we've uh, worked on one of the first uh, ITMOs, internationally transferred mitigation uh, um, obligations under the article six of the Paris Agreement. And uh, this is basically a, a bilateral trade between uh, two countries to, uh, to uh, transfer the, uh, some uh, mitigation uh, action that they've taken, so, so uh, similar to, to an offset. Uh, and, but it's uh, governed by Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, and we're expecting in this uh, COP26 for the rule book to be completed and this will define all the rules of the article 6 and, and therefore uh, we believe that these ITMOs will, will become uh, uh, much more uh, an important instrument uh, in the future. Uh, then uh, we have uh, development uh, services agreements with um, for example the ENI, uh, the large energy company in Italy to advise them on uh, different uh, carbon market aspects and to prepare them for, uh, for uh, some, some uh, carbon, carbon uh, projects, basically uh, on, on um, renewable energy. Uh, secondly, we design blended public-private climate finance solutions that de-risk investments, and I'll come to that uh, in the next slide. We work with financial institutions uh, across the region on the issuance of green and thematic bonds, and uh, we have developed uh, global impact standards together with OECD. Our development finance standards were just launched uh, last week uh, by OECD, and they've been uh, endorsed by the OECD DAC committee, the uh, Development Assistance Committee. And also we have a very large uh, climate finance portfolio in Turkey and the region on uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and so on. And uh, we, we work to, uh, to basically um, accelerate those investments in, in this space. Uh, we benefit from a partner of choice with governments, uh, and this uh, allows us to uh, work also on the policy reform and the enabling environment that's so needed in, in order to uh, advance the sustainability agenda. And finally, we offer a multi-stakeholder platform uh, that brings together civil society and, and, uh, and private sector actors and so on. So uh, this is our, our specialties. I, I won't go too much into this because time is uh, short, uh, but I want to say that we, we are, have been very active in the climate finance space. We're accredited entities of the uh, Green Climate Fund and also um, a, a, a part of, an implementing partner of the Global Environment Facility. And we have a portfolio of over $5 billion in over 130 countries, which benefit 86 million people. Uh, and uh, we implement the key international environmental conventions, including the Paris Agreement, also the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. And we help, for example, to um, 
to uh, get rid of the old uh, pops and, and to sort of uh, uh, bring and, and reuse and recycle that waste from, from the pops. Uh, and we, we have some projects in, in the region as well on this. And also we, we work, we're one of the parties, the implementing parties for the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting substance, including its Kigali Amendment, um, where, where uh, this deals with the uh, refrigerant sector in particular. And we, we help to, uh, to make, uh, to sort of uh, ensure that the uh, investments are being replaced uh, with alternative refrigerants that have a lower global warming potential. Um, so on the blended finance, I just want to uh, say that uh, we use a, a lot of blended finance instruments and we have uh, quite a large uh, portfolio in this space. Uh, and uh, well, this is 1.4 billion total contributions from uh, international financial uh, institutions and they're blended in here. You can see that the breakdown and we, we tend to use uh, these kinds of uh, uh, contributions to uh, to leverage further uh, funding from, from uh, the, the money that, that we receive, and in particular private sector financing for uh, climate. And uh, how, how is this done? Well, I mean, basically, the idea here is uh, that we bring, we use concessional finance to bring a, a, a, an unprofitable investment to the market line so that the risk return profile for private investors is at the market rate. And, and this is done uh, through concessional finance. Now there are some uh, principles developed also by the OECD and they basically um, uh, uh, sort of set out what, what, what is needed in order to, uh, to uh, work in this blended finance area. And it's mainly to achieve additionality, which is, uh, to achieve investments that wouldn't otherwise have occurred because we're at point A, which is under the market line. Uh, and then secondly, uh, to, we deploy the blended finance to address the market failures. We minimize the use of the concessionality and we focus on the commercial viability of the investment and use it as well to promote the policy and enabling environment. We have a number of instruments as well. Uh, we have our new climate investment platform, which we work with the IRENA, the Renewable Energy uh, Agency, and also the GCF, the Green Climate Fund. And this is basically has uh, as its aim to strengthen the, the pipeline of investments, viable investments in countries uh, in order to uh, achieve uh, the alignment of the uh, supply of climate finance and to match make between the investors and, and the actual investees. And uh, here's some more information on that, but I'll go uh, quickly now. Uh, we also have an instrument to de-risk renewable energy investment. And this, I've, I've sort of already mentioned it in the other slide, but this relates specifically to the renewable energy. We bring the cost down to the, uh, to the levelized cost uh, of, of the alternatives, and, and that way uh, we, we enable the investment to take place, and we're doing this uh, all across the region with different uh, partners. Um, this is our uh, portfolio and where we work, and of course we work in Turkey, but also in the immediate region. We have 18 countries and jurisdictions, and uh, our portfolio is almost 1 billion in this region, uh, with uh, 8 billion co-financing being leveraged. And these are some of our impacts that we're achieving. So uh, we're having a big impact on the ground in terms of uh, sustainability. Uh, yeah, and then I'll finish with the slide on Turkey specifically. This is our, our, our pipeline and we have about $20 million under implementation uh, and some $50 million in the pipeline here in, in this country. And it covers biodiversity, it covers integrated water resource management and also a sustainable energy financing for solar, promoting energy efficiency and what I spoke about before under the Montreal Protocol, the POPs legacy elimination. Uh, and so uh, we have a great experience in, in these uh, areas of sustainability and we hope to be able to partner with uh, some of you. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll give the floor back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. 
Çok teşekkür ederiz Laura'ya. Oldukça ilginç bir hani küresel ölçekteki Thank you Laura. It was actually a very comprehensive evaluation about uh, the networks and uh, you established a framework going all the way to green financing. Of course, the green financing uh, ha is uh, really crucial and uh, is uh, of blending uh, nature uh, so that uh, we, there are some instruments like uh, the green bonds and uh, this is uh, something that uh, we will be seeing more intensely in uh, the near future. Once again, I would like to thank you and uh, I would like to leave the floor uh, to uh, the uh, senior economist from uh, Turkonfet, Ms. Madame Nazlı Karamoğluoğlu. And uh, she will be providing us information about uh, the activities they undertake. Um, Hello, thank you. I'll share my screen as well. In the past month as Turconfed, we studied the effects of the Green Deal on SMEs and we published a report. And my presentation will follow that report, as you know, this transformation that started with the EU Green Deal. One impact is the carbon border adjustment. Another channel is circular economy and resource efficiency. For SMEs, well, the SMEs could see the CBA as an obstacle, of course, exporting SMEs along with larger enterprises as well. But on the other side, as was emphasized before, circular economy and resource efficiency pillars have some important opportunities for SMEs. When we look at the policy areas of the Green Deal, we see that it cuts across various sectors and areas. There also exists an SME strategy under the sustainable industry strategy and sustainability and digitalization are twin goals, parallel goals. Other goals are access to finance and decreasing legislative burden. When we look at the role of Turkish SMEs in this transformation, we see that it's quite a sizable role. And as is the case in other EU countries, they have quite the impact. As opposed to 7,000 large enterprises, there are more than 3 million SMEs in Turkey. Environmentally, they have very small effect, but their collective effect is quite large. For example, when you look at the manufacturing industry, electricity and fuel expenses, almost half of these expenses or other industry and services or in other sectors as well, half of the energy and fuel consumption is from SMEs. Another effect is the dynamic nature of the SME sector by incentivizing eco-innovation Environmental impacts should be restricted. Another role of the SMEs is their potential to generate employment. For example, when you look at the year 2019, more than half of the increase in employment is generated by SMEs with 50 or less employees. So the transformations and new areas of work to come about from this transformation makes the existence of SMEs important with regards to employment. So if the correct policies are designed, they have significant potential for employment. When you look at GHG emissions in Turkey between 2005 and 2018, we've registered the highest emissions in OECD countries. Of course, Europe has achieved this long ago, but still with existing policies, It is foreseen that GHG emissions will be reduced only by 60% by 2050, so it's very important to abide by these strategies. The first effect we said was the carbon border adjustment. The aim here is to prevent carbon leakage. Of course, how that will be implemented? Well, there are some questions as to that. 
the most significant possibility is for the ETS to be expanded to cover international trade and uh, the design will be presented in the days to come and it is expected to be implemented by 2023. First, we looked at, well, we analyzed the impact of the CBA on SMEs. There are two parameters here. One is the amount of carbon contained in the export. This will show us to what percentage of tax uh, the carbon load will point to under the CBA. We've calculated that by sectors. And the second parameter is the total turnovers or the share of EU exports in total turnover of the companies. So using those two, we looked at what companies will at the first stage be more impacted by the CBA on a sectoral basis as well as on a taxation basis. Now, when we look at the tax rates, the highest taxation is electricity, cement, agriculture, and metals. Of course, in the existing system, in the ETS system, only scope one emissions are included in the calculation. In countries where there's no carbon pricing, such as Turkey, scope two and scope three would also be included. So we've included all scopes. When I say scope two, I mean carbon emissions from electricity. And scope three is carbon emissions due to raw material use. The tax burden to be brought about by the CBA, the carbon border adjustment, is primarily for carbon leakage risk products. There are 52 products for which reference values have been identified. At first, it's oil and refinery products, paper, glass, ceramics, cement, iron and steel, electricity, and chemical products. Such sectors are expected to be impacted. When we look at the export side, SMEs constitute 37% of total exports. And when we look at exports by SMEs, we see that the EU is an important export market. It constitutes about 46% of total SME exports. Using these two parameters, we looked at which sectors would be impacted to a greater extent, and you see the result on the chart. We see it on a scale basis, micro and small scale companies or enterprises. Well, you see on the upper right hand side of the charger risk area, risky area, but there appears to be no sectors there due to low rates of export. But that doesn't stand to mean that these companies will not be impacted. These companies, because they're the suppliers to larger companies and with the EU Green Deal, supplying decisions will also change. So indirect impact is expected. When we look at companies of other sizes, the main, uh, base metal industry, which is also in the ETS currently, is relatively risky in medium to large enterprises. And under the assumption that the CBA will later cover other sectors, medium scale agriculture, mining and food, and for the large scale, Agriculture and coking coal sectors are expected to be impacted at the initial stage. Well, this is the results of the analysis that we've done on the initial impacts of the CBA. On the other hand, the EU Green Deal is an opportunity within the scope of circular economy and resource efficiency for SMEs. Well, when we look at the most common obstacles for SMEs that prevent the ecosystem from being sustainable are, well, the concern that such resource efficiency investments will not be profitable. Another one is lack of financial resources and of course, lack of customer or consumer demand. Of course, on one side, there is a supply side effect as well. And from the demand side, the impact that will come 
is going to be through the awareness generated among consumers, which will both accelerate this transformation. The investments made by SMEs for resource efficiency, and when you look at the effects, Turkish SMEs, well, roughly 40% have made no investment for resource efficiency, and 29% have allocated less than 5% of their turnover to resource efficiency. In addition there too, The number of SMEs who stated that resource efficiency has a positive impact on their production costs, as opposed to EU countries, well, Turkey has stated a rate higher than all countries. 16% of Turkish SMEs have said that resource efficiency measures have increased their production costs. So there is the need for some guidance on this issue. When we look at the supports related to resource efficiency rather than outside support, uh, they have to resort to their own financial or technical resources. For those who receive outside support, have done so through private financing, through friends and family or public financing. And there's very little outside support. To increase resource efficiency, well, when we look at what SMEs are required to do to increase resource efficiency, first of all, we need uh, advice on financial planning and financial planning means, waste and reuse of products within the scope of circular economy and new processes being developed and increasing industrial symbiosis requires collaboration as the SMEs underline. And of course, there is a need for consultancy on these issues. Another desired point is case studies which show the benefits of resource efficiency. These are the results of the uh, Eurostats Eurobarometer surveys, of course. And when we look at policies for SMEs, an emphasis on resource efficiency in SMEs in Turkey is most salient in energy efficiency. There are supports for energy efficiency, quite extensive supports. And for policies, well, the, the policies do have goals, but there are some shortcomings in coordination and in practice, as was stated before, the creation of sectoral policies and coordination between sectors is quite important, which is a shortcoming. And for an impact analysis, uh, data provision and standardization of data is quite important, which is an area of improvement at present. To increase the processes of circular economy and resource efficiency, while well, incentives and regulations are quite important, financial incentives, as I stated before, have, well, there are various funds distributed by COSCIP for particularly energy efficiency, and there are certain programs to incentivize innovation, but a more holistic approach is needed here. And when I say holistic, what I mean is rather integrated as a result of the innovation that was incentivized, the idea was commercialized and then uh, steered towards export. So an end-to-end -end approach. Another factor, of course, are the regulations. Like every company with a competitive outlook, SMEs believe that these investments will yield no return on the medium to long term. Therefore, the existing production processes being swapped out for a more environmentally friendly one is accelerated through regulations. And within the scope, a standardized structure is particularly important for SMEs. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Nazla, for your presentation. I believe 
this is something we will be talking about, discussing and meeting on uh, in the time to come quite frequently. I've made a few notes and it seems there's so much to be done. There are risks on one hand and opportunities on the other. Of course, if you look at it through the window of risk or opportunity, and as Mr. Simone Kaslowski mentioned this morning, to see it also has some significant work and a very good approach. And in order to get some more information on that, I would like to give the floor to the head of the climate change, environment and climate change of working group of TUSIAP, Mr. Fatih Özkadı, the floor is yours, sir. Alper Bey, çok teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you very much, Alper. And thank you to all the participants. We have really received uh, some uh, valuable information here. I have uh, shared my presentation. I hope you can see it on the screen. First and foremost, uh, we would like to thank uh, the distinguished minister, the distinguished ambassador to the uh, chairperson of uh, CIAD. I would like to thank each and every one of them for their opening remarks in the morning. As uh, Mr. Kowalski, uh, the president of TUSIAD, mentioned in the morning session, uh, prior to COP26, our strategy uh, for becoming a party to the Paris Agreement uh, has uh, to be completed and uh, it has to be supported with a uh, roadmap uh, which is carbon neutral. And I think uh, this is a critical step for uh, the investment environment. I think this is uh, something very valuable, which he also underlined in the morning and I would like to repeat now. Of course, we as the business circles do not want any fragility. We want to see uh, the road ahead. And the new climate regime has to thus eliminate the fragility as well as uh, making it possible for the business circles to see what lays ahead. And I believe uh, that opportunities are way higher than the risks that we foresee. Distinguished guests, I am actually going to share the new climate regime from the perspective of the economic indicators, which we worked on and which we shared last September. This report was prepared by Professor Erin Chieldan and Madame Seville Ajar with the participation and contribution of the private sector. The report is actually important in terms of the being the first research on the new climate regime. And I believe that this is crucial for the adaptation to the new climate regime or whether we can or we cannot adapt to this new climate regime. Evaluating the issue from the economic perspectives and fighting against the climate change, we have reviewed the current status quo and we have also identified what kind of possible effects this European Green Deal will have on our economy and our bilateral trade. Of course, the speakers before me mentioned all of these aspects in the first slides. I would like to repeat I don't want to repeat them. Of course, the aim of the European Green Deal is to establish sustainability and reduce the green gas emissions and protect its competitiveness in the industry. And by way of environmental free and climate change friendly policies, this is going to be established. What is important is the carbon regulations at the border and also the circular economy 
uh, action plans. The uh, EU economy uh, covers uh, certain sectors, and uh, because we could be losing our competitive edge in certain uh, sectors, carbon leakage possibility is now more apparent with the mechanism of uh, regulation at uh, carbon regulation at the border with new uh, taxes. Uh, the European Union is working on uh, the carbon border adjustment. Uh, and the first uh, draft will be published in, in the near future. When we need to look at the analysis the methodology of the report, this uh, new uh, activity is actually evaluating the global and microeconomic effects of this new regime. Once the carbon border adjustment is enacted, uh, in relation to uh, the uh, 24 uh, exporting sectors, we have conducted an analysis. And uh, we can actually identify uh, that uh, for uh, the carbon border adjustment, uh, we uh, are targeting 50 euros and 30 euros in uh, res respective uh, values. And uh, you can actually see uh, the same pricing in the ETS system. So third, for 30 euros and 50 euros, we have conducted this analysis in uh, this report. So I'm skipping to the next slide. In relation to uh, the greenhouse gas emission uh, by sectors, we can see uh, according to the emission inventory of uh, the Turkish Statistical Institute, we have actually seen 550 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the household uh, greenhouse gas, gas emission was uh, reducted from this figure and we have seen uh, in the model of uh, 451.3 million tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. The, in 2018, the highest emission was by electricity, transportation, cement and iron and steel. In addition to this, uh, the European Union has updated on fifth way uh, the, its uh, industrial strategy document and uh, the iron and steel uh, sector has been identified as one of the preliminary sectors where there will be a, an ETS a trading. In the next graph, we can see that under uh, the uh, coverage two and coverage one activities, uh, you can see that uh, the uh, carbon pricing is foreseen to be a 30 euro equivalent. And when the carbon border adjustment is going to be enacted, this is going to be the cost that will be achieved. I would also like to convey this information. Uh, coverage two is at uh, the uh, direct responsibility of the procedure. For instance, emissions uh, stemming from the stable energy consumption. And these are the emissions where there are interim goods produced. To summarize, if we get a 30 euro carbon price, the value of coverage one is going to be 478 million. The coverage of one plus two will be 1.1 million euros. If we evaluate over a perspective of 50 euros, again, we can see uh, the uh, emissions uh, and the cost for coverage one and coverage one plus two. For 50 euros, the total cost in uh, coverage one is around uh, eight, 800 million euros. And if we add one and two, it's 1.8 billion euros. Once we publish this report, uh, in many of uh, the uh, reports in the press, uh, they were referencing uh, to this 1.8 billion uh, euros. And I think in the next period, this is uh, going to be uh, following the developments. In the next slide, you will be uh, seeing that uh, between uh, 2020 to 2030, the dynamic analysis uh, has been uh, conducted and I would like to uh, continue how we have uh, analyzed this. For macroeconomic analysis purposes, uh, the uh, 
applicable for macroeconomic general uh, balance model was the model that was used for the study. And if we are to look at the graphs that have been obtained in, in the uh, quarter uh, carbon border management, if had had not been 30 or 50 euros, and if uh, Turkey had agreed with the EU and was exempted from uh, this uh, practice, the general macroeconomic and uh, sectoral indicators uh, would have uh, been uh, this way. We believe that there is no uh, possibility for the base path to be enacted. This is just an in interim scenario to make a comparison. And here we can see that the carbon border adjustment 30 scenario is evaluated together with the base path. And we can see that if in the configuration that Turkey does not change the current measures, there is a reduction in the GDP. And here, the scenario for the carbon border adjustment 50 is taken into consideration. And uh, this uh, means that uh, the uh, GDP, which could be achieved by 2030 with this scenario, is uh, going to be 5.358 trillions. If uh, carbon border adjustment 30 is uh, implemented, it's 5.213 trillions. And under the scenario of 50 euros, this is 5.166 Turkish lira. Here in this model, as an alternative, we have seen uh, that uh, there is a simulation for the uh, green economic transformation of uh, the EU. And in this uh, scenario, uh, the uh, phase uh, of preparation for the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement, which makes it possible for 21% reduction was uh, followed, uh, which was a commitment of Turkey prior to the uh, Paris Agreement. So the INDC uh, that was submitted uh, by uh, Turkey in 2000, prior to 2015, according to the model findings, in uh, 2030, uh, 481 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, was uh, foreseen. And instead of 130, 580 million tons was uh, targeted. And here, in the general balance model, if we add this uh, in 2030, the GDP that could be achieved under the base path uh, with the stable 2015, uh, 2018 prices is uh, going to be 5.213 Turkish liras. I have indicated before, and in relation to 2030 with the alternative scenarios, so the GDP together with the carbon border adjustment 30 and 50 scenarios is going to be a five or six percent higher, and the greenhouse gas emission is going to be lower by 16 or 15 percent. This has been our calculation. And here we can see that the, the NDC, when there has been a reduction in emissions for the sector for 2030, you can see the emissions that have been identified. Taking into consideration uh, the alternative uh, scenario of the European uh, Green Deal with a 20% uh, reduction uh, when compared with the base path, this is uh, going to be 481.1 million tons uh, of uh, value in CO2 emissions. Taking into consideration the time and uh, 
in the evaluation uh, and the outcome of the reports, uh, the uh, European Green Deal is a risk for Turkey, but it's also a new opportunity as an instrument for providing sustainable development. And I would like to indicate that, uh, especially in relation to the risk and opportunities analysis, when we first entered the customs union in 1996, was uh, similar to this. Since 1996, uh, we have uh, actually made use of the customs union to positively increase our export and also to create a, a positive environment for employment and we have transformed it into an opportunity but here we can also say that the same uh, potential for opportunity exists and in line with this comprehensive uh, strategic transformation, the emissions uh, reduction, and also the funds that will be obtained for the to be used for the green transformation of the companies, and also uh, establishing a, an alternative a green economic transformation that takes into consideration energy productivity at its center, is uh, going to provide uh, some considerable uh, improvement in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions and also the GDP. And we have also seen in that the uh, last agreement between the Green Deal and the EBRD foresees, if I'm not wrong, uh, 1 billion euros. And this is, of course, uh, something that Turkey can uh, so far not benefit. But in the coming phases, with the new financial uh, establishments and new opportunities, we can actually use this as an opportunity. The green economic uh, transformation is actually foreseeing that uh, the emissions the reduction targets uh, are going to be used for the production and increasing employment in the national economy. And it is going to be an important alternative for, for the sustainable economic development of our country. I would like to present the companies that supported this particular research and I would like to thank each and every one of them wholeheartedly. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Dr. Erin Cheldan uh, for uh, being the pioneer of the writing of this report, and also the Deputy Secretary General, uh, Dr. Nushan Numanolu, and also, although not with us now, uh, Dr. Tuba Ajkaya, uh, who has has really contributed to this research and also the working group of uh, the uh, environment and climate change. And I would like to thank all of you for your patience. We would like to thank uh, Mr. Fatih Özkadı very much. This has been, of course, uh, the report that he shared with us in our opinion for people who are working in the area of climate change. This has been a very interesting report indeed. And uh, for uh, the European Green Deal, it has uh, the following uh, perspective. Some of uh, the costs for uh, certain measures uh, that uh, needed to be taken uh, is, of course, something that we can focus on, but uh, this is also seen as an important area for investment and opportunities. So it is a microeconomic and scientific analysis uh, summarizing this approach. And uh, plus, uh, I would like to thank him for explaining this in such uh, a clear uh, language that was easy to uh, comprehend. I would also like to indicate that uh, the uh, difference between 6% and 7%, if we can adapt to the European Green Deal, this is going to be the contribution to the GDP by 6 or 7%, which is uh, crucial. I would also like to underline that, uh, especially having long-term targets uh, for the business circles, for the consumers and for the public sector is important for uh, all of these actors to take decisions uh, targeting the future. And uh, this was more prevalent in uh, other reports as well. If you are going to undertake an investment, whether this is together with the public side or the consumer, we need to see that this investment is being owned. 
whether we ratify the Paris Agreement or whether we establish a very close target, because this is going to be the decision of the political uh, actors. But the fact that this is a long term target is crucial for both the business circles and uh, for the investors. On one hand, of course, global developments, uh, green uh, production and uh, more green uh, consumption and uh, preferences to choose uh, such products. And on the other hand, the companies and SMEs uh, already existing need to decrease uh, their costs, uh, but also the instruments such as the European Green Deal, which is going to be in our lives, uh, which is going to affect our commercial life one way or the other, as you have indicated, inevitably is pushing us uh, to this path. And uh, the fact that we actually need to start on this journey, these long term targets and the using of certain funds, And uh, the fact that uh, climate change becomes uh, one, uh, the climate change target becomes one of the main targets, as it was mentioned in the morning session. One of the uh, main aspects is that, of course, um, establishing a climate neutral target for 2050, but also uh, shaping all the policy areas in line with this target and also supporting this with the digitalization and enriching it with digitalization is what we see ahead. So nothing is perfect and there could be signs that could be criticized, but once you establish a target and once you can see the way ahead, you can make decisions much more easily and uh, you can actually shape your financial resources by establishing priorities in line with the target is going to be uh, the uh, path ahead. Two days ago, the ambassador mentioned that uh, there was an opening uh, um, uh, the Middle Eastern Technical University, the Solar Resource Center with the participation of the authorities, uh, academicians who apply to Tibetak to make a research uh, should also, uh, they are, they're also being reviewed by uh, reviewing the priorities of the European Green Deal. Uh, but uh, this is indicating that uh, although it's small, this is one of the important targets for the green transformation, which has already started. But uh, maybe we need to speed up uh, this. Uh, and since the morning, uh, the comments and the remarks that have been shared with us showing that the private sector is ready for this uh, transformation. Although there are risks, this has been the signal that we receive. And maybe the public needs to perceive these signals and uh, reflect them uh, to their decisions uh, in uh, the soonest possible manner. I would like to thank uh, each and every one of you and uh, to our participants. We have established uh, important comments uh, and I would like to thank uh, Shukri Unuturk, uh, the uh, president of the Business for Goals platform to uh, Laura Altinger, who is the UNDP from uh, who is from the UNDP Istanbul Regional Center, and uh, also to Nazı Karamoğlu for sharing the recent report of Turk Confed, and lastly to Fatih Özkad, who is the chair of the Environment and Climate Change Working Group of TÜSİAD. So, following uh, a lunch break, as of one thirty. Up to this point, we have uh, discussed certain issues at the political and strategical uh, level. And in the afternoon, we will be uh, hearing from large scale companies and uh, SMEs uh, as to how this is reflected in, into the business environment. 
uh, although they might be small, but their social benefit is high. So we will continue our debates following the lunch break. And I would like to indicate once again, uh, we are expecting all of you as of 1.30. Thank you to the uh, speakers and to the participants.
Herkese merhabalar. Hello everyone. After the quite busy and intensive sessions in the morning, we are opening the third session of our webinar on business action towards climate neutrality. Without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Cevdet Alemdar, who is the moderator of this session. The floor is yours, Mr. Alemdar. Thank you very much, M Mr. Alper. I would like to welcome all speakers and webinar participants. Um, to see it uh, takes an integrated and holistic approach to economic, financial, environmental, and industrial issue, issues. And in order to limit the temperature rise with one centigrade degrees, we know that we need radical changes in these areas. Uh, and it is the European Union that has a very comprehensive program for this. Uh, Japan and the UK also announced uh, carbon neut uh, neutrality by 2050. China also has certain objectives. And this is an indication that climate diplomacy uh, is at the fore uh, in this day and age. It covers industry and financing as well, and it reshapes international trade. And COP26 is going to be one of the most critical uh, conferences. Uh, and before COP26, we need to give very clear messages as a country. Turkish business community and private sector have already initiated this radical change. And in this session, we're going to be discussing um, issues uh, with um, zero emission um, and uh, representatives from Kortsa, Archilik, uh, Roka Group, and also from the Institute of uh, Circular Economy. Um, before the panel, I would like to introduce the panelists, uh, three of our panelists. Uh, are from emerging markets and EU markets. They are the uh, representatives of these companies in charge of sustainability strategies. And our first speaker is from Roca Group in this panel. He is the sustainability director of Roca Group, Mr. Carlos Velasquez. We also have a representative from Corza, who is uh, the corporate and brand communication and sustainability manager, Ms. Nevra Aydoğan. And from Archilik, we have sus the sustainable manager, Ms. Özlem Ünner, who is in charge of sustainability policies in 22 facilities. Uh, po Pauline Tiberj is from the Institute of Circular Economy. It is based in France, but it has activities in Europe. And she is the legal and European affairs officer of this institute. She's in charge of circular purchases and sustainability structures. So if you allow me, I would like to ask my questions to the private sector representatives. I would like to start with Carlos. There has been two radical paradigm changes in our businesses. One is the new introduction of new roadmap, roadmaps under the EU Green Deal. And the other one is, uh, of course, the global pandemic. Uh, as a global company operating both in EU and other geographies, can you summarize the risks and opportunities brought by those two main events, those two shifts uh, for Roca Group? I would also appreciate if you could mention the interaction of those two developments with each other as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. The first thing that I want to say is that it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, we have seen how uh, in the last year uh, the, the, the, the, the road towards sustainability has, uh, has been pushed ahead. Uh, this is not new. You know that uh, in uh, the last uh, decade, some people were talking about the great acceleration, 
And uh, today we are uh, feeling it. Some people say that the, the, the big pandemic of COVID is, uh, is uh, partially caused by, by this. So at the end of the day, what we are facing is uh, uh, new regulations. We are, uh, we are uh, uh, talking about uh, the Green Deal uh, and all this uh, legislation uh, in the different countries. But I would like to mention that this is not the only driver. It is the social pressure. We are feeling more and more, all of us, the social pressure uh, towards sustainability. It's on not only the communities where we have the factories, it is also the customers that they buy our products. So either we respond not to the legal requirements, but also to our customers and our communities, or we will be in trouble. Now, all the, the people represented here, it has a, a special feeling about sustainability, obviously. But together, only all of us, we cannot do anything. This has to be a common action, a common commitment from all, not only the ones here, societies, governments, industry, services. Uh, in Roca, what we have done is uh, we have integrated sustainability in the strategy. The Roca Group has six pillars in the strategy, growth, innovation, digitalization, people, also sustainability. And this is important because from the, from the pillars, sustainability is one of them and it comes top down. That means that it arrives to all of us, all the 24,000 employees of Roca Group, starting with the CEO. We included this, uh, this uh, in the strategy, and I think that this is, this is the most important thing, that we include it in the strategy to accelerate. Because I think that now the, the, the word is not sustainability anymore. Now we have understood what is sustainability. Look at all the, the, the, the people here, sustainability directors, sustainability uh, managers. We, we understand that. The word here is acceleration. And to accelerate, everybody, governments, companies, society, needs to, uh, to, uh, to make an effort than previous years. For us, this, eff this effort is creation of a department, creation of a sustainability committee, because the sustainability department is not enough. We need to involve and engage all the, di the directors, marketing director, human resources directors, pro productive process directors, supply chain director, IT director, all of them, they have to be part of this implementation because it's holistic. The, sus the, the, the sustainability is not only environment. It is the three Ps, people, planet, and performance. So all the legs of the company has to be represented and have to push in the same direction. Now, how we have found uh, our way into this complex issue? Integration in the strategy, triple impact, and we define uh, with the sustainability committee, eight work streams. Eight work streams are decarbonization, sustainable materials, sustainable products, people, society, supply chain, logistics, and communication of the sustainability. This is 40 projects inside these eight work streams, and all of them, they work for the sustainability, but they work for the company. And I will give you some examples. If under work stream number one, decarbonization, working with Schneider Electric, our consultant for decarbonization, we start investing in reusing the heat of our kilns into the dryers or into the warehouses, we are benefiting the environment, the planet, because we are not emitting CO2 less than in the past but also we are reducing our energy bill. So my advice to all of you, 
sustainability from industry will only make sense if there is a business case behind, if there is a business impact. When you reduce water, you reduce your, your, your cost. Where you reduce energy, you reduce your cost. Where you are giving health and safety measures to your people, you are increasing motivation and you are increasing profitability in your factories. Always look at the sustainability measure and look for the opportunity because if not, your company will not accept it. Turn it into a positive thing. The same is with the COVID. With the COVID, we had two things here, a big drama or a big opportunity. Well, we decided to make it a big opportunity. First of all, understanding that we have to protect our people, number one, protect our people, and second, protect our operations. And how do we did protect our people? Sending them home and giving them equipment to work from home, the white colors and the blue colors, giving them all the, all the measures, all the PCRs, all the, the, the dis social distancing, uh, uh, all the, the, the masks, the, the, the, the gels for uh, washing the hands, so this, at the end of the day, turned back into us as a recognition from our employees that we had done things in the right way. And this, I tell you, you can feel it in the floor plan by the recognition of the people and their, the return is how they work for the benefit of the company. I felt at this moment that everybody had the, the, the the will to safeguard the, con the company working as a team. Th thank you very much, Carlos. I mean, uh, when I was listening, I took the notes of uh, being the importance of being uh, uh, in search of a business impact as well. And also uh, the second note I took is about the involvement, the importance of involvement of all processes in the in the business setup and then the last one is uh, as far as i understand what you said about covid and this change you are saying that when life gives you lemons you make a lemonade out of it so thank you very much uh, let me shift to uh, korsa uh, if you let me uh, avrupa birliği yeşil mutabakatının birlik dışındaki ülkelere yansımalarını uh, can you um, assess of the impact of European Green Deal on non-EU countries uh, and on your company. So how are you preparing in terms of circular economy and climate change? How do you use digitalization to accelerate this transformation? Thank you, Cevdet. Well, Carlos's remarks were on the one hand inspiring but on the other hand it also showed us how every company deals with the same things i uh had the accelerator shelf because the green deal was always has been integrated into course of strategies from the accelerator side the green deal actually points to a new order in economy and trade it's a chance for transformation and change this is where we approach it we've used it as an input on our own journey Corsa is present in five countries, four continents, and 12 country, uh, 12 facilities. We work for different cultures. And we work in aviation, automotive, and tires industry, where the emissions are quite intensive. The good part is, per their natures, quartz's products become sturdier as they become lighter. This is an emission reduction factor, but that's not sufficient. That is to say, it's not enough for us that the nature of our products is suitable to sustainability. So in 2019, just like Carlos emphasized, we've integrated sustainability into our strategy and we see it as a strategic initiative today. What that means is starting from the CEO and the board as well, we report to the CEO and the boards on a certain set of goals. So there's a monitoring system in place for that as well. And we worked on, on our 2050 sustainable goals. We looked at short, medium, and long-term goals. We identified such goals. So 
in 2021, we also announced 2025 and 2050 because we are a publicly listed company. We opt to conduct our sustainability goals and transparency while reaching those goals or while setting those goals. The one side we looked at was the stakeholder, the customer, the investor, the employer, what do they expect? And we looked at how we can distinguish ourselves from the competition because this is a distinction. And we also looked at what the market and the regulations say. These are already things that uh, we looked into as we develop our products, but we also looked at them with a the suitability, a sustainability outlook, apologies. Well, within the scope of environmental and social governance, the things that we're following in that scope, we continue to monitor them through this uh, triple perspective. So it also includes inclusiveness. Uh, climate, water, waste, and on the other hand, sustainable growth is also among the targets monitored as a part of the 2050 goals. And this is part of our idea to transition to Corsa 2.0, so to generate a new company out of the existing company. As you all know, the UN has the Sustainable Development Goals, and we've chosen five SDGs to be more focused and our sustainability goals are also under those five SDGs. Perhaps the most salient one is to be carbon neutral by 2050 and zero waste by 2050. We don't only look at emissions from production. We attach importance to our products being sustainable products as well. So we are also studying swapping out certain raw materials, renewable energy, yes. And in fact, clean energy that we produce, we generate ourselves, we're working on such models too. And then next year, we, for the science-based targets, we are planning to receive approval and we are working and marching down that path. This whole system, actually, well, as, as I was listening to Carlos, it's uh, these types of meetings set the benchmark for us. That is another good thing because similarly, we've created, created a sustainability network. We attach great importance to this because we're in Thailand, Indonesia, Brazil, the US, Turkey. So we have various capabilities and levels of preparedness at our facilities. Some work for aviation, some work for the automotive industry, some for the tire industry. So the goals are also distinct from one another for sus uh, sustainability. So it is a large structure within which we are fortunate that at the board of directors level, we have great support and they in we incentivize this mechanism through rewards. And a nice output of all of this, one that makes us very happy is that in CDP in 2021 in Turkey for, well, we are among the top three companies that uh, in water and climate. And that was an output of what we did. It's at least an indication that we're doing things right. That's what we attach importance to. So part of your question, Jared, they included the circular economy. I would like to briefly mention that as well, because as I said at the outset, it's about distinguishing yourself from the competition. Circular economy is paired and twinned with well right now we what we do is we use the waste from our own processes as raw material input we have tire strengthening techniques uh, from recycled plastic and this is at the global recycle standard so it is uh, globally certified and we're right now monitoring their journey towards commercialization this is a first in the world in our own sector and we attach importance to that listening to the client listening to the market whereas we were the ones who would talk to the clients about this right now it's the clients who want to use these because there are regulations rolling in as well as uh, the green deal that we discussed for europe and there are reflections on the us as well but leading the way well help us distinguish ourselves and help our clients distinguish themselves as well. And that's a very important part of our strategy. For the last part, you had a question on digitalization. 
as well, which I could respond to as, well, it could be considered from two points of view. For one, energy efficiency. And perhaps it could be better to talk about emission output rather than energy. For quality control, digitalization is an indispensable tool now. It's a part of infrastructure because you can control quality during production, not once it's been shipped to the client. That means speed in production and reduction in production emissions. On the other hand, it's, a, it's an indispensable asset as well because we're in five different countries, 12 plants. As you know, what's most important is data. Without data, you cannot see the trends or the direction the company is heading and you cannot see where you're going until you see where you've been. So data management, performance monitoring and best practices to for them to talk to each other, digitalization is again an indispensable tool we use. Well, thank you very much. What I've noted from your speech was that growth and productivity is usually mistakenly considered as the enemy of sustainability. And I've heard that you put them together, you combine them. And that's parallel to Carlos's message. So it's a good business case that this is being considered, all these items is being con considered as a whole. Now, when I come back to Özlem Hanım, Archilik is doing very significant work in circular economy. It's climate change, loss of prevention of loss of bi biodiversity. That's very important in that area. Half of the GHG emissions is from, well, uh, the water stress is mostly caused by resource extraction and utilization. So as Archelik, you have some innovative practices when it comes to circular economy. So could you tell us about that as well as your future goals? Of course, Jared Bay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to speak to you in this panel. When I heard from Carlos and Nera, I've seen how companies who've come to a certain point on this journey have passed through similar places. So a brief introduction, we at Archelik consider sustainability as a business model. So our purpose in doing this is to add value to the company and add value to the stakeholders. And by considering sustainability as a business model, we will increase the value of our own brands and also uh, touch on the financials of our company in the eyes of the investors. In the latest uh, issued green bonds as well, it was actually, it almost served as proof of how successful we've been. It's been a good validation for us. Now for circular economy, our company has its own R&D unit, which, as you said, is responsible for 22 facilities in eight countries. And they're in collaboration as R&D Central and R&D at the factories. They develop particular formulas for the reuse of recycled materials. And they're produced by our suppliers with the given formulas and used in our products. Actually, in our own sector and in many other sectors, this was quite uh, the first implementation, recycled PET bottles being used in our own products. Right now, we've recycled more than 58 million PET bottles. And that shows how large a business model our, our own R&D can create by using recycled plastic and it actually paved the way for future projects. These recycled bottles are now in washing machines air conditioning units, dryers. It's used in many, many products. In fact, we've paved the way for them to be used in other uh, group companies. We use some recovered material in ovens and we also use uh, industrial textile waste. We've recycled more than eight tons of fishnets and 110 tons of industrial textile waste. We've also produced uh, a refrigerator out of bioplastics. In fact, our CEO Hakan Bulguru said, produce such a refrigerator that when I bury it in my backyard, it should disappear in two years. Of course, it's not possible now, but it is uh, 
something that we're aiming for. So we're shooting for the moon, if you will, with some of our purposes. And this, while well, the production, uh, mass production will be quite commonplace, I believe. Uh, right now we produce, uh, we offer this as a niche product, but we all are going to roll our production. We also use coffee waste and uh, tomato peels as uh, plastic parts after they're recycled for small household appliances. What we call eco-plastics, really all recycled plastics uh, well, are used in a in products, we've used more than three tons, three thousand tons of recycled plastics in 2018. In 2020, this figure almost doubled. Also, as Nevra mentioned, in the processes with our supply and in our own processes, while well, the waste generated from those processes have been recycled and they're used as packaging material for our products. Also, recycled packaging is very important in our opinion, and that's the case for the consumers as well. What is recycling and why should we recycle? It's important in explaining those two facts. What we use for the most part in our products is styrofoam. Uh, for one, we have projects on recycling styrofoam and replacing styrofoam with recycled cardboard or other alternative materials. And we have covered grounds in mini scopes and our products are heavy products. The storage conditions, it's a quite a difficult process working on sustainability. Well, when you start, you see the obstacles before you and overcoming those is a difficult but satisfying part of that journey. In Turkey and in Europe, well, we are the only company who has their own recycling facility. In Eskişehir and Boz, we have two uh, waste recycling facilities. The circularity, as you know, our, the world is only 8.6% circular and electronics have a major part in that. Uh, they're a large part of the blame. So we have a responsibility as the manufacturers and we've established such facilities in Turkey for in Eskişehir and Bolu. Uh, in 2014, when these were established, we've recycled more than 1.3 million products, which means 52, 2.5 megawatt wind turbines uh, electricity generation for one year. So the savings were massive. We collect the products from the market, no matter what the brand. So we also help actually the collection of non-energy efficient products being collected from the markets and we recycle them in our own plant and we sell them back to our recycling facilities and they transform them into other products. So to ensure a fully closed loops, the parts we obtain from that, uh, well, well, there's work on the way to use those parts in our own products. For smaller parts, we can do it, but our work for using, utilizing larger parts is ongoing. And lastly, very important for us, we're talking about the climate crisis and the climate crisis, as you know, we need to limit the rise in temperature by two degrees by centuries end. And the physical risks and the transition risks of the climate crisis, well, are very important points. And we've done a scenario analysis this year and water risk is the largest physical risk in our case, therefore, We've issued a closed loop recycling target globally to all our enterprises. And the closed loop system, I believe, is an important step in water savings as well. That is the general outline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Özlem. Very good examples. And we also get to see how things are reflected in the products, how circular economy is reflected in the products, and then how it affects the overall life cycle of the product. And actually collecting all, regardless of brand, and this being reflected in internal processes such as water usage uh, are what you shared. I need note of those. And you've given us numbers which made these measurables for us. And I think that was an important point for those following our 
webinar. Now, if you'll allow me, I would like to turn to Carlos and I will ask the same question to you as well. Those three companies here all have uh, global operations around the world. And uh, we have heard a couple of examples, uh, particularly from Kortsai and Archidik, about what is being applied. The question is, uh, how uh, Roca being a, a global company with many factories all around the world, how do you uh, transfer the knowledge across the company, countries, across the factories? And uh, how do you take this to a, a global perspective uh, rather than uh, singular uh, factory uh, initiatives? I think you are on mute. Mute? All right. Now you can hear me. Um, there are different kind of projects inside our uh, work streams. There are some projects that they are uh, lead by a department. Example, in inside of uh, uh, the, the work stream uh, sustainable products, we are uh, now working with a design uh, a university to uh, understand what does it mean design for sustainability. It is not only designing products that they don't consume water or as, uh, as much water as uh, our faucets or, uh, or uh, uh, uh, cisterns in the toilets that they flush with dual flush. No, no, no. It's more than that. And uh, my colleagues have explained about that. It is about the, the entire life cycle of the products. How do you design for cradle to cradle or cradle to grave for the right to repairability, etc. So this is one thing that obviously it is driven by marketing. And then the PMs that they are designing or defining the products, they irradiate this to the entire group. But there are other projects that everybody needs to make an effort. For instance, decrease water consumption 5% in each plant every year, or 10% or decarbonization 7% uh, uh, every year. Now, how do we do that? We assign one project leader. This person has the support of the sustainability committee. It has OPEX and CAPEX. That means that it has money to do it. And it has resources. And how do we work? This team leader with the team that supports him, it has a counterpart in the different regions, Asia Pacific, America, uh, Western Europe, and, and Eastern and Central Europe. And we detect one person for the region that is the counterpart. This person is part of this team and it is responsible to implement the decisions taken into this part of the world, but more important, it is, in, it is also responsible to bring the best practices in this part of the world into the corporate so they can be transferred to the rest. So this is how we are doing this. this some projects are quick, some projects are managed by one department and only, but some others are long lasting. And these teams that I explained, they are cross countries and they are for a very long time. This is not a matter of one year. These teams are deployed to stay like uh, five, six, seven years or non-end because there is no end to sustainability. Thank, thank you very much. This uh, best practice sharing and uh, team formation across learning. Cross learning is really impressive to learn. Uh, Sevgili Arçelik, uh, Özlem Hanım. Now, to distinguish representative of Arçelik, Özlem Ünler, what would you say? How do you reflect this uh, to uh, your global perspectives? 
Yes, uh, as Carlos has mentioned, this is a long journey and it's not that easy to be able to uh, manage uh, something at the global level is really difficult. And as Nevra has mentioned, everybody has a different level of uh, commitment. And uh, in fact, what we do uh, is, uh, I indicated that sustainability is a business model for us and we have a working group within this context. And actually in every uh, country, there are uh, people responsible for energy, people responsible for environment and for sustainability. So these people actually do the reporting and actually by instantaneous following up of their reports, especially if the energy usage is improved by the data system that we have and we have access to this data and within these context, we identify our targets in a global manner. And once we actually get our targets to be approved, we can actually disseminate this through the global level. What, why is this important? Because our company is a growing company in developing countries. And the uh, demand for energy as the middle class grows larger increases. And that's why the targets uh, for our global products and uh, the the practices to becoming global is really important because it's a long journey, as I said, and uh, there are certain markets where we have a certain performance. And that's why in those markets, there is no regulation, for instance, for minimum energy performance saver or products. And even in those products, we are saying that we are going to send the products which save the highest amount of energy, changing the workloads, etc. And in order to establish globalization, as Nera has mentioned, as well, uh, we have appointed uh, sustainability ambassadors uh, to these regions. And uh, that's why we organize webinars, for instance, when we have established a target. And this is uh, important for the workflow of our country. We have a global webinar that we organize and we actually try to increase the awareness on the employees. And that's how we uh, identify and implement a global strategy. And also uh, we have global targets, but we also attach importance to localization, for instance, uh, for the Pakistan uh, market and for instance, for the UK market, there is different in Pakistan market, uh, biodiversity is more important. And of course, the CEO and that country has certain commitments and uh, that's why we have cooperation with biodiversity in Pakistan. And we also have uh, CEOs actively working in empowerment of women in the business life. And in uh, UK, we actually market with the Beko trade brand. And there we uh, discuss how we can uh, provide sustainability with that brand. So we're trying to govern both the global structure, but we're also trying to create localization in each area. And that's uh, really supported by the work power. And that's why uh, the employees believing in this uh, path uh, and journey is really crucial. And as Nera mentioned, uh, effective involvement of the upper management is crucial and disseminating this uh, to uh, the uh, peripheral organization is also crucial. Of course, it's not disseminated in the same speed or in the same manner, but what is important is to have an equal distribution of this. And I do believe they can attain this. Thank you very much, Özlem. Uh, you really indicated that this uh, channel uh, structure uh, in terms of sustainability in the UK, for instance, or in the larger sense, where each local structure has different needs, understanding these needs and listening to them, and including the, these in the sustainability strategy is really crucial. And I think these are important and good benchmark points. And thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, Nevra, what would you say about Kortsa? How do you carry this to the global perspectives? What are your examples? Thank you very much, uh, Jay, that uh, I would like to focus more on the client and the supplier actually in uh, answer to this uh, question, because as Carlos and uh, Özlem has mentioned, the structure that they have uh, underlined, uh, which I also tried to convey in the first question, is similar to what we have. Uh, but uh, at this point, I would like to focus uh, sustainability journey together with the client, knowing your stakeholders, understanding your stakeholders, 
plus actually identifying targets together. Uh, in courts, uh, the structure that we have, uh, we, we this was a journey that we tried to convey to the supplier as well as to the consumer. In consumer, sometimes uh, you are faster or sometimes the customer is faster, so there might be such markets. Innovation and this transformative power and the global uh, transition is actually only possible by aware of a wider global cooperation. And uh, giving this is, uh, uh, for instance, a technology that we have developed together with Continental in Germany. It's a green technology called Cocoon. And it's actually a technology that the regulation is not demanded from the tire market, but this is a new technological change that we expect to happen in the near future. As you know, the tire sector is much more conservative and it's actually difficult to, to transform. And there are a lot of regulations. So uh, the recycling uh, materials is now more in the agenda. But uh, this is a technology that has been used within a century and we changed the chemical materials. It's been actually uh, supported by a long R&D process. So before the regulation was even issued, in order to transform the market, we actually uh, started using new uh, environment friendly chemicals uh, where the tire is going to be uh, holding on to the road. It is actually exciting because it's not just about the product, but there is an innovation in the business model of the product itself. So if it's sustainability that we're talking about, in order to increase the speed, maybe we would be uh, governing this uh, on our own, or sometimes we thought that maybe we should be even more competitive together with our customers. And we created a pool of patents and we said that uh, it's not going to be managed by courts and nor continental. We are now managing this through a third party with a legal firm and we have now uh, registered the patents. What we try to aim is to disseminate this. So this is actually a resource that we have been using uh, and we now opened it to our competitors and so did our competitors and the Continental did the same. This was to be able to develop this further together. What we only expect is the formulas that you have developed are to be uploaded to this pool of patents and transform the market together. Today, uh, with this uh, new technology, we have produced 250,000 tires. And apart from Continental, we have uh, four other users in the pool of uh, patents, and uh, there are more than 70 applicants for this open resource. So it's actually a, a good figures for the tire market. On the other hand, the supplier side, as Carlos and Ozam have both mentioned, this is not uh, something that uh, you can do on your own. Yeah, Sustainability yeah. is only made possible together and we can only reach our targets faster. So as courts, uh, we are of course uh, subject to certain valuation, but we took one step back and uh, we actually uh, included our suppliers with the same valuation process. So we started following them for sustainability uh, reasons and we're sharing the court's sustainability journey with them so what we're trying to do is prepare each other talk about the path that we are ongoing and we will slowly include the raw material suppliers as well and it is included by many different raw material suppliers where we have a couple of suppliers for that raw material or where it's more Asian uh, dominated, but we try to include this into this journey. And this is a valuation journey. And I do believe that we're going to cover distance faster together, especially under global uh, conditions. I do believe we can ad we adapt faster. Thank you very much, Nevra. So you have actually, uh, as a B2B company, talked about the uh, making sustainability technology uh, a standard for this uh, sector. And uh, you have indicated that this could be done together with the clients. And this was uh, an example of uh, such a method. So to wrap up, 
I do believe that I would like to, first of all, provide information uh, at the beginning of the webinar. I indicated that uh, Pauline Tiberge was going to be with us, uh, but I do believe that there has been a technical problem and she is unable to join us. So I would like to uh, verify the first announcement that I made. We are closing to the end uh, of our webinar and this session. I have uh, taken certain notes and I would like to share them with you. And in the meantime, if you have any questions uh, from the participants, we'll be uh, glad to answer them. I do believe we can uh, allocate a few more minutes to their questions. And while we're ending, uh, waiting for the uh, questions, let me say the following. In relation to the comments on sustainability, uh, all the participants are uh, indicating that this uh, demands success of business case and uh, it, this sustainability uh, could be defined. They do not necessarily have to be uh, opponents. Uh, and we have listened to such examples uh, from our panelists. And secondly, we also heard uh, that uh, we this is actually a very comprehensive process indeed. And uh, this was how Carlos also mentioned uh, it. It's not uh, just uh, the job of one function or one individual. It's something that could be done all together. Uh, product design could also uh, involve sustainability, but we could go way beyond that. And Archelik uh, gave very good examples, so did Roca. And also we talked about the total cycle. Then we talked about the production itself. There were good examples like water, like energy, where sustainability targets could be the targets where we could contribute. We also talked about the best practice sharing where the uh, best practices uh, could uh, be uh, from within the company or uh, from amongst uh, the participants uh, that are listening to our webinar. And uh, there could be different needs at uh, different locations, but one way or the other, there could be consolidated and there we could con contribute to the establishment of a unity. And together with the clients, uh, the uh, relevant industries could also be uh, considered in terms of an holistic re approach. I do believe that we have a few more minutes, but uh, in the meantime, the technical problem has been resolved. So we could now listen to Pauline Tiberish uh, from the Institute. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, one question for you. We have discussed many things uh, all across the subject. Uh, I will not summarize it. Uh, but, but one thing uh, that Turkish business society is very much interested is in how other developing countries uh, are responding to the European Green Deal, yeah. apart from Turkey. And from your perspective, would you consider the current state of transformation happening in uh, those other countries uh, as well? And in developing countries, what should be the first step to address to the global transformation triggered by the European uh, Union Green Deal? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> the spring next year, global news sounds like a, a new call for transform our model of society. The air crisis measure that we are going through reveals the importance of the air and public awareness, the independence of market, as well as the fragility of supply chain in raw material, energy, food product, or even medicine and care device. The issue uh, observed should lead us to uh, respond in a coordinated and ambitious manner. Third, beyond the uh, stimulus uh, plane um, aims at restoring the economy as we know, it is necessary to size the opportunity to invest 
uh, to the transition to the circular economy and climate, uh, climate neutral economy. It is thus a question of uh, reconciling the short term check represented by the construction of the economy falling, the COVID crisis, uh, the revival of trough and the balance of the markets and the stake of long term, which are fight against climate change and construction uh, of a just and sustainable society. These are just as uh, urgent. The reconstruction uh, of a more viable world must therefore be done in conjunction with the efforts made to lens and consequences to the air crisis. Our production and consumption pattern must be reformed in order to relieve the uh, pressure on uh, natural resources and decoup the uh, well-being of the population from their use. The European economy will have to rebuild in accordance with the principle of the circular economy, sobriety, uh, optimal management of resources, short um, uh, local plan, in order to build a viable model today that respects the limits of our planet. The circular economy action plan modifies the regulatory framework European Union with the view to aligning it with the objective of the new Green Deal. So Sustainable Europe just passes through three major um, objectives, promote eco-design, uh, strengthen the power of citizen consumer and public buyers, and support industry towards the circular economy. Several uh, sectors are concerned, textile, furniture, packaging, plastic, battery, construction, so the exporting country will organize a production uh, accordingly with the, uh, which will improve the quality of the exported products. Uh, now for, for the first uh, question. And for the other one, um, I, I think there is no uh, blending legging implication but it gives board guidelines on investment and decision in particular. Several uh, transversal supports are planning in the European Action Plan for Circular Economy uh, and in the Green Deal too, uh, to mobilization uh, of financial funds and economic aids, support for digital tools, and support for integrate accounting. We therefore know that uh, in the sector targeted earlier, uh, there will be financial support uh, to support the ecological transition of this sector, which will therefore offer more sustainable so solution. Yeah. The, so um, if you have a, a, another question, I... Uh, the, thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, what, what I'm hearing that now that uh, you explain, you gave answers in a very comprehensive manner. In the first part, uh, your answers are pretty much what uh, we, we had been uh, discussing, uh, that is the uh, promote the eco design and also buyers and also the manufacturing itself. Uh, let me switch to Turkish here, if you will. Actually, Pauline uh, talked about issues that are complementary to what we've discussed, the eco-design, um, integrated approach and uh, manufacturing. And she also said that this is encouraged. Uh, and wh while she was talking about ecological transformation of industry, she talked about integrated accounting and digital tools. So integrated accounting systems or reporting systems are very important. And she said that uh, these systems 
uh, are supported not to exceed our time now i would like to thank all our panelists uh, for what they have shared with us this brings us to the end of our panel uh, thank you very much for listening to us i hope you've taken notes of what has been said thank you
Evet, herkes herkes merhaba. Hello everyone and welcome. We're discussing a, a topical issue, Green Deal, ecology, environment. These have a bigger role in our lives as, and as of now in our business life as well as in our daily lives. Under the leadership of the European Union, uh, we see that incentives are given to environmentally friendly practices. Uh, incentives are not provided to uh, carbon emitting industries anymore. So we're we'll be discussing climate compatible strategies and practices. We have valuable uh, speakers, and I would like to start with Özgürlük uh, Dida. Thank you very much. I will be sharing my screen. UNDP and Ministry of Industry and Technology have launched a project, and I would like to inform you about this project. Uh, the project stakeholders, SMEs and indus uh, organized industrial zone representatives will be taking the floor following my represent uh, my presentation let me give you some information about our project ministry of industry and technology director general of strategic research and untp have been um, implementing this project gf global environmental fund is our uh, is uh, financing our project. This is a project about promoting energy efficient motors. The project started in 2017. It will continue until 2022. Uh, of course, we want to make it sustainable. Um, we also receive grant uh, grants from COSGEP. Uh, we carry out research and studies uh, to support SMEs, to raise awareness among SMEs and uh, to make sure, sure that energy efficiency uh, is reflected on uh, protection of environment and climate change. These are the components of our project. We have five main components. Uh, we are trying to strengthen legal and policy a framework uh, so that we have a higher efficiency at the same time um, we also uh, try to build capacity of our stakeholders to raise awareness about energy efficiency uh, raising awareness and creation of databases uh, is a component at the same time um, we also uh, are developing a test laboratory at Turkish Standards Institute. Uh, we have a two-phase motor test program here. I'm going to be going into the details in a few minutes. So uh, our objective is uh, to uh, produce energy efficient motors. Another component is uh, to make sure uh, that SMEs in uh, the industry have access to energy efficient motor funding and uh, for this purpose uh, to turn uh, the, the uh, uh, organized industrial zones as one-stop shops. And we have pilot uh, projects running in seven organized in industrial zones. Uh, we have a two-phase motor test program and uh, the test capability has been increased to 375 kilowatts from 90 kilowatts. A special type motors are can be tested now. As of April 2019, we have uh, trained 28 uh, inspectors in terms of market surveillance uh, and uh, in terms of eco-design legislation and uh, we have tested 37 motors in the first phase uh, they all fall uh, within the limits of tolerance and they meet uh, the relevant criteria this is very important for our country now uh, more efficient motors are used and we are dam not damaging the environment this is very important in terms of reducing carbon footprint 
uh, we have uh, started uh, the field application in 2020 and uh, we uh, started to work with 164 companies. These are companies uh, that wanted to work with us. And then uh, we have carried out detailed preliminary uh, studies with 100 uh, companies. Uh, and as a result of these studies, we have had uh, meetings to, uh, to uh, assess uh, these studies uh, with all companies on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, we also try to uh, raise awareness about energy efficiency and these assessment meetings uh, continue at the moment and we are now replacing motors in four organized industrial zones and in the remaining three organized industrial zones which are pilot sites we will be replacing uh, existing motors with energy efficient ones. As I said, we have uh, the support of COSGEP. Uh, we have uh, uh, received, uh, we provide uh, grants uh, to uh, motors with, uh, which are uh, locally produced. Uh, the upper limit of the support is 80,000 Turkish euros. And the main purpose of this project is uh, to ensure uh, transformation in the market and to make sure uh, energy efficient uh, motors are used. Um, the project also aims uh, to encourage uh, energy efficiency investments. Uh, so raising awareness is very important within the framework of this project uh, to, to limit uh, the uh, temperature rise by uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, the electrical motors that are used in the industry at the moment will be replaced with energy efficient ones and those electrical motors that are to enter the market uh, will have a higher efficiency. As uh, far as uh, the feedback from SMEs goes, uh, the SMEs uh, are happy with uh, the replaced uh, energy efficient motors. Uh, this is great uh, because this is also raising awareness. So we're taking small steps together, but with these small steps, we believe we will be able to protect the environment. Uh, TEVMOD project's main purpose is a transformation in motors, but it also serves uh, global objectives as well. It serves the sustainable development goals. Uh, accessible and clean energy industry innovation and infrastructure responsible production and consumption and climate action so uh, these four sustainable development goals are also served by this project service maintenance processes uh, occupational health and safety processes are all uh, covered by this project and more importantly it encourages environmentally friendly technology use and contributes uh, to uh, the fight against climate change um, in all the meetings with uh, um, smes uh, we are telling them that non-energy benefits are also high and this is not just uh, savings and uh, this is not just economy this is also important for the next generation young people uh, to protect the environment and the planet and uh, we always emphasize uh, this um, and uh, in our pilot studies we try to raise uh, um, energy efficiency awareness in in the project we have used asynchronous three-phase motors and uh, we are encouraging the replacement of uh, these motors between 075 and 375 kilowatts and uh, ie2 ie1 and eft type motors have been replaced replaced in the field we try to recycle them so that they're no longer used for production and this is how we try to raise awareness as regards waste management as well 
This is our system approach. Uh, it's not focused on the motor itself. Uh, it's also the load, uh, the uh, controls, uh, the uh, power. So all elements, all comp uh, components are taken into account. Uh, to make sure that the system is efficient. This is what we tell the SMEs as well. 80,000 Turkish Lira grant may not be really uh, high, but it is important to reach out as many SMEs as possible and to raise awareness. Therefore, we will um, uh, continue with the system uh, approach. So we're not only focusing on the motor, but the driver and the entire system so that the SMEs understand that with a system they can achieve efficiency because you can uh, increase the system's efficiency from 30% to 75% by uh, working with all these components. So this is the re uh, outcome and uh, the attainments of the project. Up to now, we have worked with 100 SMEs that uh, the motors are still being replaced. And after the replacement, we will have the exact data uh, as a result of uh, the uh, calculations. Uh, but uh, for the moment, we have uh, encourage uh, SMEs uh, to replace uh, 980 motors, and uh, this will result in a reduction of 1,815 tons of carbon emissions. As, as said since the morning, uh, these are all uh, important uh, steps, though small. So with this TEMOT project, um, we are trying to contribute to the fight uh, against uh, climate change and uh, what mattered it, it was to raise awareness among SMEs and we try to do this with 100 SMEs that we work with. Uh, we want to create a uh, culture, uh, an efficiency culture. Uh, we have seven pilot organized industrial zones and uh, we have two speakers among us from uh, these pilot organized industrial zones and uh, following my presentation, they're going to talk about what uh, kind of experiences they've had and what are the uh, what the attainments are. Uh, so from Adana organized industrial zone and Kalupsan uh, defense aviation representatives will be sharing their experience with you as well. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. These are very important steps uh, which emphasize uh, that uh, in on top of economy, a clean environment, clean world uh, is important. So these are all indispensable endeavors. Thank you very much, uh, Özgyanım. These are striking uh, initiatives. Uh, when I first learned about uh, UNDP, uh, I also uh, had the chance uh, to be in the, uh, to come to know Turkonfet. Um, and uh, they had a Turkey-Ukraine business forum in Ukraine, and I was the acting chairman of a Turkish-Ukrainian business council. And uh, through UNDP, I had the chance to meet Turkon Fed. Uh, so um, UNDP, UNDP's efforts and endeavors in all fields, not only in climate change, uh, are very important not only in this region but around the world so i would like to thank you uh, thank you ndp uh, but uh, uh, it, it, although international organizations provide support it is uh, the business people uh, enterprises and public officials that uh, implement uh, these initiatives in the field. Um, now, uh, I would like to give the the actual practice in the field. I think uh, Darshan uh, Aykut is disconnected. Uh, then let's give the floor to Tuğçe Demirdelen. Hello, my name is Tuğçe Demirdelen, Associate Professor. I'm representing Adana Organized Industrial Zone. 
Uh, we are one of the pilot industrial zones. Uh, I would like to give you some information about our uh, industrial zone. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the contributions this project made, and I'm going to share you with certain share with you some uh, pro, uh, pictures. Uh, we have 458 enterprises in the Adana industrial zone, um, machinery, textile, electricity, different sectors are accommodated here. Uh, and uh, approximately 170 of these companies are SMEs. Uh, these, the, the companies uh, first met energy efficiency in 2011. Uh, energy ef management unit was established in our uh, zone and uh, companies uh, were provided with certain services by this unit, um, their consumption, uh, their need uh, to increase efficiency were all reported to them uh, by the organized industrial zone through this unit. And uh, through certificates uh, and uh, through support by COSCEP, uh, industrialists uh, manage uh, to transform their uh, practices. As Özge said, uh, our uh, in industrial zone is one of the pilot uh, industrial zones in Tevmot project, and the companies in our industrial zone therefore uh, got to learn about energy efficient motors and project related practices have been launched. Uh, 15 companies benefited from Tevmot project. They started to and replace their motors. You see the names of these uh, companies. So these companies are replacing uh, their motors with energy efficient ones. The, the uh, motors used by these 15 SMEs uh, were quite old and they were not energy efficient. Uh, so Within the framework of the project, uh, these 15 companies have replaced around 100 um, motors. Normally, uh, these companies were using motors at a rate of 50 or 40 percent efficiency, and they were not aware of it. The feasibility studies and the replacement of motors with energy efficient motors showed uh, the SMEs uh, that they were losing energy. So replacing their motors have lowered the cost and increased the performance of machinery. We embarked on this journey with 15 companies, uh, but uh, the other companies are inspired at the moment. So if um, there is another project, they will they are willing to participate in it. Some companies have already started replacing their motors uh, at their own expense. Some companies um, ha uh, have started to um, make uh, assess uh, assessments of their boilers and uh, gas turbines, not uh, to see uh, their energy efficiency level. They are not only focused on motors. So this is the biggest impact that the project created. Maybe um, if we just gave them certain lectures, this uh, would not be that effective. But uh, once uh, they uh, replaced the motors and used them, they have seen uh, the impact. So uh, the feedback from companies are all po uh, positive. Uh, while these companies uh, were working on energy efficiency, uh, they became aware of the European Green Deal as well. Uh, the companies uh, want to be informed about Green Deal. Uh, energy efficiency is very important in terms of carbon emissions as well. So while working on energy efficiency, uh, we have established a Green Deal 
board. Uh, and uh, we have started to work with companies that already have um, launched uh, green uh, technology transformation. So Telmod project stakeholders uh, have been the pioneer and organizations, institutions in, in the area and uh, the sector representatives uh, are now uh, implementing Green Deal uh, uh, criteria as well. I would like to share some pictures with you. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the old motors. On the right hand side, uh, the new ones. Uh, so uh, these are quite old uh, motors with an efficiency of 40, 45, or maximum 50% efficiency. Uh, low energy efficiency motors. So these motors have been replaced with high, uh, with uh, energy efficient motors. I would like to share some other pictures. Uh, of course, some companies have replaced 10 of their uh, motors. Some companies have replaced just two or three motors based on the size of the motor. But even if they have, they replace two or three motors with energy efficient ones, they made sure that the other motors have been checked as well. So they identified which motors have low energy efficiency and they're working on them. This is another uh, picture from another company, the uh, motors replaced. Um, so this is another uh, company. The old uh, motor is replaced with a new one. Uh, this is another uh, motor. So as I said, um, around 20 um, old motors were replaced with energy efficient ones. Uh, 35 companies are uh, are, uh, for 35 com companies, the replacement is still work in progress. Uh, the companies expect us to continue with projects like uh, Tevmot. Uh, the project might be small, but it has uh, had a big impact in terms of uh, awareness raising. I would like to thank UNDP and uh, uh, you for giving me the opportunity to promote uh, our practices. Thank you. Thank you, Tuchu. Of course, OIZs are the pride of our country. As you know, the first one was established in 1962 in Bursa with a World Bank loan. And we have over 1,350 OIZ is successfully operating. Bursa is has an export of about $6 billion. And with the EBRD support as well, the organized industrial zone model was really, uh, it served as a role model across the world, and especially with UNDP and EU support. OIZs in Turkey will be the pioneer in our country when it comes to the Green Deal and a greener economy and sustainable development. Thank you once again. It was the early 90s in a Turkish German school. It was biology class and they were showing us a video where some bovines were grazing and they were releasing some gases. And the video expressed how harmful those emissions were for the world. And of course, we were young and 30 years ago, we couldn't perceive that agriculture would contribute to global warming. But after many years, we saw that, that this is actually a problem in the world at a rate of about 15 to 20% of carbon emissions coming from animal husbandry, agriculture, and the methods used therein, and the wastes produced from those methods. So the Green Deal, when it comes to industry and agriculture, while the agricultural sector has a very important place with all its stages. Recently, there have been some remarkable initiatives in our country. Today, one of our panelists is actually a very distinguished entrepreneur, Ali Eroğlu, who 
is a very special person to me as well. Even hearing his tone of voice is soothing, despite, uh, in addition to being a very good speaker, he's also a very successful business person, so I'll now leave the floor to him. And thank you very much, Burak, but you made things a little bit difficult for me. You've raised the bar, and I must say I'm a bit excited and nervous now, but thank you for the compliments. I would like to thank the participants for taking the time to listen to us. And I would like to share these sentiments. Since 1997, in what I've done in agriculture, it's been actually what's now at the heart of the Green Deal. But it now it has become a necessity of the real world rather than my wishful thinking as it was back in the day. I will talk to you about two of my businesses, which are right at the core of the Green Deal and which feed into the Green Deal. So as an agriculture company who operates in this area, I will talk about how we support the Green Deals and briefly talk about our products and experiences. Let me just share my screen now. Can you see my presentation on the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. When we look at the parts of the Green Deal related to agriculture, it's there's the there's becoming carbon neutral. Agriculture has a very important mission here because agriculture and plants for their own development actually capture carbon from the atmosphere to be able to turn it into nutrients in the soil. So the more plants we grow, the more we will have a natural mechanism to solve the carbon issue. Uh, the most important element is farm to fork, for which the EU has clear goals until 2030. The pesticides being reduced by 50% and synthetic or chemical fertilizers being decreased by 50% and organic agricultural areas share in total agricultural land in being increased to 25%. And then these also mean enriching biodiversity. And why is that important? Well, there's such a balance in agriculture that when we do not pollute it with chemicals and we allow biodiversity to take its natural course, nature itself will present to us what we want to do with the chemicals and pesticides. But since the early 1900s, with concerns of feeding the global population, as always has been the case, to preserve or boost productivity in agriculture, the use of pesticides, that is chemical drugs, to eliminate pests, and also to be able to provide sufficient amount of goods. We've nearly uh, spent a century using chemical fertilizers to do that. But at the end of that century, we see that these are not sustainable. And as we can see, we need to suppress, in, in, the, in the goals, we need to suppress these methods. And at present, we start with biodiversity and then mending and then protecting the ecosystem and structure. Of course, pesticides have a particular place. And in the deal itself, the licensing and use of pesticides have certain policies in different countries, which will all be revised towards updating the system. My latest bit of information is about 
Uh, well, there's an ambiguity on the carbon border adjustment for agricultural products. Well, if you look at it as pesticides or fertilizers being used on the plants or in the plants during production and the environmental pollution they cause, if you look at it in the later sense, I'm guessing that in the very near future, agricultural products will be subject to a carbon border adjustment. My company was founded in the Netherlands in 1967. I've been a partner in Turkey since 1997. Well, nature actually does work out any issue on its own. In the Amazon, there are no chemicals or there's no artificial uh, fertilizers, but the plants have been there for centuries. From time to time, there are attacks that nature cannot control within itself, which leads to destruction, such as COVID. But nature always mends itself. And our company is inspired by nature. We look at the interaction within nature itself. And we look at what could be to the benefit of agriculture to see whether or not there are useful organisms in nature against pests or disease or some would, something that would support fertilization. We are always looking for natural products and we improve their production processes. And that is our mentality of operation. The approach we have is, as you know, soil, this isn't something for Turkey, but it's a global saying. It's the soil is the mother. First, you leave a seed or a sapling. A soil nurtures it like a mother. The plant grows roots. It grows until harvest. On one hand, you have root growth and plant growth. And then they become plants uh, to feed us or for other, other industrial purposes. And you have to protect the mother. The mother must get priority, that is the soil. And we have some products that deal with the soil. As the plant grows, of course, there are external attacks, illnesses, damage, etc. But we have some products that completely support the deal as well. And the other need of plants is pollination. In order to be able to produce fruit, they need to be pollinated. And we have a product that helps that as well. The products range from products visible to the naked eye to microbiome. All our products are things that exist in nature. They are natural without any uh, genetic modification. But they're the products of that natural intera interaction. The bumblebee bee that provides pollination and then the microbial products that, that cannot be observed by the naked eye all serve agriculture. And what I, how I actually put this is, let's call it back to the future. We're trying to bring agriculture back to the way it was when it first started, but at an industrial scale. Well, cats feed on mice, frogs feed on flies. Millions of living beings in nature have such interactions between them. And sometimes those interactions can be used in line with our goals as humans, and that's what we do. Of course, every living being has certain mechanisms and systematics. For example, in agriculture, For the useful pests to feed, the harmful, while they feed on the eggs or the larvae of the harmful pests. So when we introduce the useful insects, when they consume the eggs or larvae of the harmful, the harmful ones will not 
succeed in other generations. So it brings about an auto control mechanism. Another mechanism is the parasitoids, which is a remarkable mechanism. Some of our beings as you can see in the picture in the middle they inject their own eggs into the harmful pest so they use the harmful pest as a surrogate these are very specific relations therefore when we bring in when we introduce it will find that insect, lay its eggs inside that pest, and it will succeed in another generation. Also, some secrete natural elements. It's not an interaction, but it's a natural secretion, which above and below the soil uh, help combat or suppress other harmfuls. We have an organization as well. It's called the IOBC. And they have certain predictions that as of 2050, the integrated combating or biologic combating market is in their estimate going to be at a level of 35 to 40%. But with the Green Deal attacks as of last year in the EU, I believe we will reach this goal sooner or that by by 2050 the market will be much larger because we are now through with chemical pesticides it's just like using antibiotics in humans because pests are developing immune systems and they're passing it on from generation to generation so they're becoming stronger and more resistant to chemicals but in the Beneficial organisms in that mechanism that nature has developed, they have been in existence since the world came to be. And as long as it continues to exist, they will be in that natural struggle with one another. Of course, Green Deal reducing chemical pesticides by 50%. Well, we see the elements of it in our practice quite clearly. Since 2003 in uh, Turkey, we've been trying to develop and improve this sector and these practices. The chemicals used in greenhouses, well, we've reached 90 to 95% uh, of suppression. So that means We've been able to reduce uh, 10 times, well, 10 uses of chemical pesticides to one or two, which is very important both for human health and for the preservation of the environment as well. Einstein has a saying about bees, which we all know, if it weren't for the bees, we wouldn't have food, particularly for plants that bear fruit. And they flower for a very short period of time. It depends on the plant. It's either one week or up to two weeks. From time to time, it's wind. From its time to time, it's small insects. At other times, there are strong vectors that allow for the pollen to be transferred to the stigma, the female organ of the plant, which is what leads to the fruit and bumblebees. bees well honeybees are a significant vector as well but bumblebees bees have a superior performance to honeybees for pollination well this the bombus bee for microbials, it started with the bombus bees, etc. And the industry has grown. But recently, we've had a rapid inflow of microbial products in agricultural practices, because these products are still, again, found in, in the nature. They have, I mean, they can be used for plant protection. 
It could be against fungi, it could be against bacteria, virus. But these are products from nature itself. And they combat the insects, pests, or uh, disease in other ways. Also, microbial products, along with the protection of the plant, uh, they promote growth and make the plant more resilient to stress, especially uh, climate change, drought, extreme heat, and disruption in the fertilization regime during such periods, th these really truly uh, support the plants. Also with the uh, in-soil use, they regulate the microbial life in the soil, which allows and in fact motivates root development in the plant. So stronger roots mean the intake of more nutrients which means it maximizes the benefit that plants derive from fertilizer. And that means we can use less fertilizer in a unit piece of land. And it considerably supports the uh, goal of reducing the use of synthetic fertilizers. So with applications in the soil and on the plant itself, since our founding day, really, we've been producing solutions that lead to the desired outcomes of the Green Deal, which is becoming even more and more uh, salient in its importance. And I must say that it personally is a great pleasure to be working in such a field. And this is the last slide. I have two things here. Food waste is an important issue. We hear from time to time, uh, such percent of the bread goes to waste. That's something we need to stress as well. And as is the case in all products, agricultural products are, well, on the packaged products, we need some considerable developments in those areas as well. So if you'd allow me, I will now close out this presentation and move on to my next. I hope we are good for time. I hope you can see this. This is a colleague of mine, a company uh, that has been uh, quite uh, w well established. Uh, this is a new uh, establishment and this is also supporting uh, this uh, policy. That's why I wanted to share it with you. In agriculture, we need to pay attention to the dynamics of uh, the Green Deal and we also need to see the aspects that support usage of technology. And this system is actually uh, supporting both sides. And uh, I just wanted to explain this in detail to you. So with a brief uh, movie, I would like to pay attention to these uh, factories uh, for plants. Yes, this is in Antalya, and it's actually the 
former version in terms of automation. Uh, we uh, will soon have the second version supported with robots. We saw during the pandemic uh, that uh, uh, there is especially a lot of uh, transportation in terms of the agriculture products because not everything is raised everywhere. Uh, plus in areas where there is serious uh, disruption of uh, this uh, transfer, for instance, Germany had difficulty in uh, obtaining and finding workers from Poland and taking into consideration this kind of a threat uh, for the agricultural sector, we can uh, easily uh, see that uh, there we will have extra cold or extra warm areas which will have difficulty in raising plants or where uh, sustainable uh, products are grown four seasons a year, or where there is uh, such uh, an approach, and especially in uh, these uh, systems, uh, these could be established just at the core of that uh, province uh, of that metropolitan city. And there, the supermarkets could easily obtain uh, products uh, fresh from uh, the tree. So uh, especially in the last decade and also in the last six, seven years, these uh, countries uh, with these conditions, especially with this new generation approach for agricultural products supported by large scale funds and uh, divided with itself is, are developing such systems. Within this system, we have a totally closed uh, environment it could be as hygienic as an operating room and it could be designed as such the uh, light requirement of uh, the plants is met with the developed technologies by minimum electricity consumption and also the production plants in line with the protocols that you develop on the day that you have identified identified and uh, we can actually obtain the number of products at the high quality that you have targeted in terms of fertilizers. I'm not going into the detail like the warmth of the water, etc., or the uh, temperature of the medium. So uh, if you set all of these at uh, the uh, desired or required uh, set of values, think about a plant factory, which has shelves in itself in a multi-layer functioning. I don't want to say, but uh, behind that, uh, even uh, in relation to human health, behind uh, the uh, organic uh, agricultural practices, uh, the system also bears uh, the organic uh, agriculture certification uh, criteria in the US. And as I have mentioned, thank you to consideration uh, being uh, involved within the city without having to transport the products with zero pesticides to the consumers. Why zero pesticide? Because it's a totally protected environment and that's why pests cannot enter uh, that media. So if the climate conditions that also created such diseases are also taken into control, there, there's almost no disease at all. The plant is fed and when you provide the fertilizers, etc., this will mean that you will totally have a, a correct product. And the aroma could be at real values and it could be really uh, fresh. So it's a, a plant factory. You have seen in, in the brief uh, film uh, that uh, with the unit area uh, of an open agricultural practice in this system, you can have tenfold the production. And the duration that you use is nine saved 95% because you don't need to use that much water. In terms of fertilization, you also save 60%. And this is a totally controlled uh, production at the field, uh, where, which is very close to the consumers. Uh, because these are more shelf systems and uh, these are more apparent in terms of uh, the smaller uh, plants, but with the research and development, we have not yet produced trees, but for uh, 
products like the tomatoes, eggplants, uh, and uh, peppers, cu cucumbers, etc. We can easily produce them. And the most important uh, aspect is that it's totally hygienic, and it's the uh, highest level of protection to protect uh, the environment as well as uh, the human health. And we can obtain a good certification uh, practices for this system. And uh, this is uh, the system that I wanted to present. I just wanted to end my remarks as such. And I would like to thank to Seattle Confed and the EU delegation for this organization. I'm grateful to all of them. And I do believe that it's been an enjoyable uh, experience for me as well. Yes, thank you very much to uh, Ali. It was both a presentation uh, that uh, was uh, deserving to our ears and to our eyes. I'm in Ukraine, and I know that uh, it's the third actual agricultural uh, supplier of uh, the European zone. Uh, Antalya is our agricultural capital, and maybe because you have a, a Dutch partner, you have been able to uh, initiate this process even uh, at an earlier stage, and we have been proud of uh, your uh, practices. Of course, when you ask the question to people younger than 25 in the EU, there as to what is the most important topic, there are a lot of uh, issues like employment, the refugee crisis, and many others, but the first topic that they cite is environment. I don't know whether we had a similar questionnaire, but this is actually a very developed uh, generation and uh, this understanding is very developed. We can also see this in the style of the European people as uh, the growth of our country is concerned that these are really important steps. And I do believe that uh, developing countries such as ours uh, should be supported. And that's why we, I believe EU support is crucial. So from the capital of agriculture, let's go to uh, our capital, uh, to uh, the uh, defense industry. And I do believe that there are important uh, areas where the Green Deal is reflected. And now I would like to leave the floor for, uh, to Darshan Aykut from Kalipsan. Your microphone is on mute. I hope you can hear me. Yes. We cannot hear Mr. Aykut once again. The microphone is on mute. Can you hear us, Mr. Aykut? I, in terms of using the time, and uh, we cannot hear you. Mr. Shahin, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, in, in that case, let's go to the Trakia Development Agency, and I hope that we can hear Mr. Aykut later on. Development agencies are crucial institutions, and from time to time, we develop projects with the, the development agencies. In Turkey, the Green Deal has to be more uh, apparent in terms of the private sector and also the civil uh, uh, sector. If you'll allow me, I would like to leave the floor to Mr. Uh, Mahmoud Shahin from the Trakia Development Agency. We'll be very glad to hear your comments on this. Thank you very much and greetings uh, from uh, Trakia, both to Ukraine, to where uh, you are situated, and also to uh, the other provinces from where our distinguished participants are uh, joining us. As you have mentioned, uh, the development agencies are organized in 26 uh, regions in 81 provinces uh, in uh, Turkey. As a Trakia Development Agency, we are responsible for Trakia, Kutlili, and Edirne from Silivri uh, and of Istanbul all the way up to the borders. So this is the area that we are serving. We are working under the Ministry of uh, uh, Industry and Technology. And in that sense, 
both uh, our ministry and our development agency are working on uh, the productivity. And as the distinguished par participants have uh, mentioned, whether it is the EU projects or whether it's projects with our own resources, or sometimes uh, the municipalities and other institutions might be conducting joint projects with the development agencies with their uh, local resources, uh, which includes energy efficiency or other areas that uh, concern the Green Deal. And uh, this, the year 2021 has been declared by the ministry as uh, the resource efficiency. And uh, that's why This was important in terms of attracting attention to this area, which included energy as well as uh, the green energy and green deal. All our colors were uh, chosen to be green, yellow, and similar colors. So establishing agenda, attracting attention, awareness raising have uh, been the main aim behind this. But also, on the other hand, uh, within our own resources, we started using our resources more in this area, providing pr projects to be created. We have companies that have received such support, whether it is a private uh, company or whether it's the institutions of the public sector. We are developing joint projects. Some projects uh, are uh, national. Some uh, could be the EU projects. And in that sense, uh, hopefully in the years 21 uh, and 2022 were, are going to be years where we will focus more on productivity, energy productivity and efficiency included, in addition to climate adaptation. And we will support this target uh, as much as uh, possible. We're already undertaking many different activities because we do believe that there is a dimension that the world is uh, traveling to and uh, Turkey uh, should also follow the same path. We cannot say that uh, we will be lagging behind, whether it is regional or local, when the whole world is faced with this huge problem of uh, climate change and climate adaptation, we need to understand that this concerns our regions, our provinces, and even our districts. And everybody is uh, working uh, at their utmost. Everybody is undertaking a lot of different uh, projects to achieve this aim. In relation to resource productivity, energy efficiency, and uh, processes, we're trying to attract attention uh, to these areas. And by getting certain projects to be developed, we are aiming our region to uh, make its contribution in this area by providing consultancy services uh, and training to the private sector. For instance, energy efficiency or green energy is one of the issues that we have been uh, discussing. So changing of machinery or making the buildings green buildings or establishing transformation in relation to green energy has been uh, one of the focuses uh, of uh, our activities this year we started a project with the eu support for three million euros together with our ministry we have more than 200 companies in this area and we are going to provide this support to them and 130 companies are going to be provided with consultancy services on energy efficiency in addition to these consultancy services the companies Hopefully, as Özge has mentioned, in Adana, Antalya region, some of the 
provinces have been uh, selected as uh, a priority OIZ. Uh, but in Trace region, uh, we do not have uh, any such OIZ. We have made an application uh, to the ministry. And we do believe that by way of this project, uh, some of the uh, OIZs, uh, especially based on uh, these uh, areas, would be prioritized and they would be uh, re receiving subsidies uh, from the SME institution. So aim here is both provide consultancy services for changing of machinery and equipment and uh, obtaining uh, the support from the SME institution or from the Ministry of Energy. We want our companies to benefit from uh, such services. Hopefully in 2022, we have 130 companies and uh, we will be rendering such services to them. Also, there are certain grants provided by the private banks. They have long-term loans. And uh, we are also talking uh, with the WF because using minimum amount of water is a topic that needs to be tackled together with energy efficiency because we want to do we want to reduce the use of water as well as energy especially for companies that consume a lot of water which means consuming a lot of energy so in this sense with wf especially uh, the uh, companies that uh, provide services to uh, the uh, large-scale brands, we are going to be working with them to reduce their water requirements and energy efficiency. We have reached an agreement, hopefully in 2022, we will have a, a financing uh, opportunity of uh, 30, 40 mil million euros. On one hand, while we are working with companies in the private sector, on the other hand, as a development agency, we have the capability to work with the private sector, but we also have the opportunity to work with the uh, public institutions like the municipalities, uh, the uh, cooperatives, and uh, many similar institutions. We have uh, the opportunity to conduct projects with them. In that sense, the uh, Thrace region is, since 2016, has been supported for uh, energy efficiency, especially for irrigation cooperatives, where there is uh, pumping facilities of uh, the municipality. We have been focusing on renewable energy resources of, like uh, wind energy or solar panels. We are supporting them so that they can conserve energy and they can also use natural sources of energy. And for 2018-29, we've sub supplied a project with 6 million Turkish lira and the total budget has been 10 million. While we were doing this, our aim was not just the material side of the contribution, but by performing and conducting projects in all provinces or in districts, setting an example to the other institution as to how to implement a project, what would be the cost of it, and by showing this to other companies, we are encouraging them to use this model and obtain information so that they can uh, support uh, similar activities in their own provinces and districts. So this uh, project of 10 million, the new project has been initiated, but in three provinces, 26 districts, uh, this uh, number has now increased to 33 projects, both in terms of wind, solar, as well as biogas energy to conserve uh, energy resources, as well as contribute to, to the Green Deal. Uh, also as uh, the development agency, we uh, have a holistic approach we believe that the issue is uh, 
concerning productivity, we see all resources, whether it's energy resources or water re resources in the same manner. And we want these resources to be used in the most effective, in the cheapest uh, manner, uh, in terms of the least amount of harmful output they might have. As I have said at the beginning, there is a material dimension. Okay, we're talking about 10 million, 20 million, 30 million Turkish euros, uh, and this is for the benefit of the companies or whether it's uh, the uh, irrigation cooperatives, etc., or by establishing solar uh, panels uh, to uh, provide them support. We are bringing benefits so that this is more visible, but another dimension is to create awareness and to identify what could be the benefit when something like this is established. These are all crucial by way of advertisement or by way of other promotional activities. We are providing also training to our companies and other institutions. So because we are public institutions, we are trying to disseminate this in our region and explain its benefits, or if in the long term we do not choose this pathway to inform what kind of basic problems we might be facing. We are conducting feasibility activities and research, and we are sharing this with our stakeholders for long-term benefits. It's a, a big uh, region. It's important in terms of agricultural and livestock. And it's also very close to, to uh, the U European uh, region. And there is a lot of migration to this area. There are factories and large-scale uh, industrial establishments that have been uh, built here. So we have both the industry as well as important investment in agriculture and livestock. So all of these are forcing us to be pioneers in this area and work together. And we as the development agencies are working together with the governor's offices, municipalities, NGOs, and we are conducting a lot of activities. And I would like to th say thank you. Burak Bey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thrace is a region where industry embraces agriculture. It's in western part of Turkey, a gate opening to Europe. And it's a great pleasure to hear that you have such incentives. Sometimes people come to Ukraine and ask, what kind of incentives are provided there and i'm telling them that, that there is no um, word in ukrainian for incentives so we're jealous actually uh, incentive is important but it's just 50 percent uh, of the issue uh, the real what matters is uh, to understand this issue and to uh, mature it so through training, uh, promotion, the advantages and disadvantages need to be told to people in a way to involve all stakeholders, including private sector and public sector, and also chambers of commerce and industry. So this is even more important than incentives, but of course you cannot do anything without money. Companies, need something uh, to uh, uh, go on. Uh, so incentives are important. And in the Thrace region, um, th there is a perception of industry, but uh, we see that industry, agriculture, and animal husbandry go along with each other. One does not um, hinder the uh, other one. So in a balanced manner you can do all thank you very much you are right it's not enough to have the raw materials um, or money only you need the business community and entrepreneurs now i would like to give the floor to um, darshan aykut from sinjan organized industrial zone 
uh, the, the, his company is Kalipsan, and we will be able to hear Darshan Aykut, I hope. Yes, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry for this technical problem. Kalipsan is a defense industry company, uh, 35 years old. We also uh, supply to the household products, white goods, and energy consumption is very important in that industry as well. Uh, we are also active in the energy industry. This is very important there as well. It, I mean, it is very important for us to use energy efficiently. And as you can understand from the name of the company, uh, we work in the defense industry. We have energy efficiency projects in place, especially in the energy industry. Uh, for the energy industry, the, the discussion is on 1%, 2%, but we wanted to do more. So uh, we start seeking for projects. And we uh, learned about Tevmod project and we discussed what we could do within the framework of this project. We made an analysis and we wanted to, to start using high energy efficient motors, organized industrial zones uh, supported us uh, in our endeavor. And uh, we have come up with an analysis at the end. We were thinking that the savings would be one, two, three percent, but as a result of the analysis, the savings was 12 percent. This is a significant saving in energy industry, in uh, energy efficiency. We wanted uh, to uh, implement four phases. Two phases have been completed, and we are the first company that implemented TevMod project. We have this title now, so we set an example to other companies. Um, so other companies become really in became really interested uh, in energy efficiency. This created a synergy, and uh, we have now awareness about energy efficiency. Now we are discussing how much more efficient we can use energy. So we created a synergy. The third and fourth phases seem to be very uh, to uh, seem to be uh, very successful as well when, once they are implemented. Uh, the companies are mainly concerned about uh, halting their operations, uh, but. Uh, we didn't have to stop our operations. Uh, it was really easy for us. Uh, this transition was really uh, for us and uh, we've been really successful. And other companies uh, appreciate what we did because there is a huge problem with energy and we should have done something about it. We received support from COSGEP um, there's no problem there. And other companies are going through our analysis. They also uh, do on-site inspections and we mainly preferred uh, local domestic motors uh, and the efficiency of our machinery increased as well. UNDP team and OIZ team have become our family. We're now a family. and uh, we continued working with inverter motors and we've uh, changed uh, the uh, uh, the uh, band system uh, so uh, we diversified uh, our uh, practices which resulted in uh, high energy efficiency we also worked on our belt and pulley technologies. Hopefully, we will be finalizing this project very successfully. I'm very happy to be a part of this project. The work in progress is 
quite successful and at the very end i believe we will achieve the ultimate success and uh, we are determined to finalize what we've started uh, darshambe thank you very much um, we participate um, in many uh, webinars uh, especially online because of the pandemic um, but there are not many uh, webinars, online webinars, where everyone is very happy at the very end. And what you've referred to is very important. Uh, we need to raise awareness about energy efficiency. Uh, the EU delegation's initiative in organizing this uh, webinar is very important, but public sector, private sector, Turconfet, uh, TUSIAT, UNDP, uh, they have all come together in this panel and within the framework of the European Green Deal, we've discussed what should be done uh, for the uh, business community uh, to take action towards climate neutrality. This has been a quite uh, fr fruitful, um, very uh, useful panel. I would like to thank all the panelists, Özge, Tuğçe, Darshan, Ali, Mahmoud. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and I hope that uh, EU support will increase uh, because uh, de developed countries Uh, are working on climate change and we have to work together like in uh, the case of the pandemic if we don't work together uh, we cannot uh, succeed and survive thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, Mr. Ehlivan. This has been a useful panel. And if you allow me, I would like to recap uh, today's webinar. I'm not going to take much of your time. In the opening session and in the second session, uh, we have seen that we need clarity in terms of climate change objectives. This can be the ratification of the Paris Climate Agreement. This can also be the implementation of strong policies to resolve the climate uh, crisis. So we need to set this as an objective. This is important for private sector not only in terms of uh, competitiveness or integration with global markets, but based on calculations uh, made, uh, this will contribute greatly to the country's economy as well on the basis of GDP. Therefore, um, a ratification of the Paris Climate Agreement is important and this should be a target companies uh, which are a part of the international value change actually have already embarked on a sustainability journey but this has to be uh, spread to others as well and in the last session, some interesting examples have been given. The efficiency of motors. Once a motor is replaced with an energy efficient motor, uh, the greenhouse gases that cause climate change can be reduced uh, drastically. Uh, in the beginning, we see that people were cautious about the expectations, but once uh, the motors were replaced, um, the result exceeded the expectations and turned into a profitable investments. And we uh, 
capture the greenhouse gases uh, by sustainable and good agricultural practices. So uh, sustainable agricultural practices are important stepping stones in achieving climate neutrality. And uh, as we have seen in the case of Trace Development Agency, the transformation has already begun, but uh, uh, this transformation needs uh, to be encouraged. Uh, we must continue to encourage this transformation. And this shows us why we need clear targets and objectives, because Uh, funding needs increase in awareness raising activities mainstreaming uh, climate neutrality setting it as an objective will all uh, make things easier for us uh, making things easier is important because uh, paris climate agreement foresees uh, that temperature rise should be limited by uh, one uh, degree celsius by the end of the century but when we look at the commitments of governments by the end of the century uh, global warming will only be limited by um, 2.5 to 3.5 degrees Celsius. Therefore, we need to take determined and urgent actions. This is what the scientific world tells us, the scientific community tells us. Uh, pu public sector has a role to play, private sector has a role to play, NGOs have a role to play, and individuals have a role to play in achieving these objectives. Therefore, this is a, an issue that needs to be resolved through collaboration and cooperation. This year, uh, the 26th uh, uh, parties uh, meeting uh, uh, with parties to the climate uh, framework agreement on climate uh, will be organized in Glasgow in November to uh, make sure that temperature rise is limited by one 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So clear and determined political objectives will be set to accelerate the transformation that is in progress. This is what we have heard uh, from all the uh, interventions made. This is my summary of the entire day. Without further ado, I would like to thank uh, the business community for targets, UNDP, Turconfet, European Union delegation for their contributions. I also would like to thank all the speakers who took the floor throughout the day. I would like to thank the experts. I also would like to thank the interpreters. They are very important. They were with us all through the day, uh, interpreting uh, speeches and speakers, even uh, with uh, difficult accents. Uh, we would like to thank the interpreters as well. And I hope uh, um, in this digital uh, webinar, uh, uh, we have discussed very useful um, matters. And I also would like to thank the technical team uh, for an uninterrupted uh, online webinar. And finally, my thanks goes to our audience, the participants. Uh, thank you very much. I hope uh, that we will be uh, coming together in other events on climate diplomacy. The uh, recording of this meeting will be 
uploaded to the YouTube channel of the European Union delegation. Those who missed this webinar can uh, listen to this.